What's going on guys, it's your boy Scrub here, back again with another video. Hope you guys are having a great day, I know I am, and Merry Merry Christmas Season Time. As you can tell, it's day two of the 12 Days of Scrubs, the yearly series where we just kind of go over my favorite videos from the year. If you're looking forward to it, I'd really appreciate you taking a second to press the like button. If this video gets, I don't know, 10,000 likes, then Santa will double your presence this year. That's the word on the street. Not not true. Other than that, if you want to get the Karen Christmas sweater, link down below. And uh, yeah, without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Get some hot cocoa or whatever people do these days and uh, relax. Uh, it's a story time from my childhood. I don't think I've told it before here on the channel, but basically one of the people I used to live next to uh, and another kid and I used to have like our little group we would hang out with in the neighborhood and we ended up getting into an insane situation we shouldn't have been in and uh, we all stopped hanging out after that. Our parents stopped being friends. It was just crazy and it all revolved around one person being kind of cringe. Either way, I thought it would be a very entertaining story time y'all would enjoy. So uh, yeah, without further Further ado, let's get right into the video. Alright, so uh, way back in the day when I was a young little whippersnapper, I would spend a majority of my time outside in the neighborhood. Things certainly have changed. I describe myself as a little bit more of a cave troll now. But back then, as soon as I would get home from school, I would get my homework done as fast as possible, then go outside and like ride my bike, play sports, whatever it may be. And we had a lot of kids in our neighborhood, but there were two that I really got along with. And for the purpose of this story, I'm going to name them Red and Green. Uh, just because I've been playing some Pokemon recently and those names sound like uh, good ones for this story time. You know how it is. You know someone's cool if they're just named after a color. Like, whoa, alright man, you got some, some mysterious thing going on. Either way, Red, Green, and I would hang out like more than any other kids in the neighborhood. We would hang out with other people, but it just so happened that we would be the ones like over at each other's houses. We would play Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 together, split screen style in the basement of one of their houses. And it's rare for houses in Las Vegas to have a basement, so I remember being like, whoa, he's rich because he has a basement. So if you're out there and you have a basement, congratulations. Uh, younger me would have thought you were rich. Either way, we were all pretty cool and we would do just normal things. We're uh, pretty into street hockey there for a bit. We would have airsoft wars, just that type of thing. And naturally, because we would hang out a lot, our parents started to like get to know each other better. And for a while, we would just hang out basically every single day over at someone's house. And it was a pretty good time. But Red wasn't necessarily the greatest influence in retrospect. Like, don't get it twisted, we were friends. But, you know, hindsight's 2020, and he was not exactly the best influence of all time. A few of the times I've gotten in, like, big trouble at school was because of him. And listen, at the end of the day, I'm my own person. I could have said no, but he would put ideas in my head, like, hey, let's skip school. Hey, let's do this. Hey, do you want to, like, I, I don't know, uh, shoot the garage door with an air soft guns, stupid things, and he was older than me, so it didn't happen often, but every now and then we would get in trouble together. And Green was the same age as Red. They were both a little older than me, and when Green became our good friend, it kind of worked out because Red had to chillax a little bit, someone could push back against him, and obviously I could have, you know, I just felt like I don't want to piss off the older, cooler kid, but whatever, we had stopped getting into as much trouble, and every now and then, Red would still try to be like, hey guys, let's go do something stupid, let's go do this, let's go do that, and Green would be like, no, we're not gonna do that, so my parents enjoyed that the group had gotten uh, a little bit bigger because the stupidity had dropped a little bit, but eventually, Red just started getting smarter about how he wanted to do dumb things, in Christmas, was coming up and we were all talking about what we wanted to get for Christmas and at the time I really wanted this like I don't know if anyone remembers this company they made like spy gear for kids I can't remember the name of it right now it might have just been spy gear to be honest but they had this like remote control tank car that had a camera on it and I really wanted it and that's what I was gonna ask for for Christmas and uh, green was like I really want to get a new Xbox so that's what I'm gonna ask for for Christmas and red says oh I'm gonna get a go-kart and all of us were like, dude, you're gonna get a go-kart that's sick, your parents are gonna get that for you, like, are you sure? And he was like, yeah, I was talking to my dad, he says he got a go-kart when he was my age, so he's gonna get me one so I can start learning how to drive. And obviously, Green and I think that this is the coolest thing we've ever heard. Like, when you're a young kid, one of your friends having a go-kart is possibly the coolest thing you can think of. 
In fact, at the time, we were like watching a, a spy movie when he told us he was going to get one. I can't remember the name of it, but there's a scene where the kid's like driving on go-karts away from somebody on the road. And we just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And on our mind, we're like, yeah, that's what we're going to be doing, bro. We're going to be being chased by the cops on this go-kart. Everything's going to be going awesome. Clearly, if you're running from the cops in a go-kart, things have gone very wrong for you. But we were too young to like really think it through too much. Ah, oh, high-speed chase in a vehicle that can only go 35 miles per hour and in all of our minds we were imagining that the go-kart he was going to get for Christmas was going to be like one of those racing go-karts with a, a little bit wider base to it so they're hard to flip over low to the ground whatever but Christmas comes along and I get my spy car green gets his Xbox and sure enough red gets his go-kart but it does not look anything like the go-kart we were expecting it to look like uh, it was more of like some pipe kind of wrapped around a lawnmower engine that some dude had made in his garage and it definitely did work as a go-kart. Like, you could start the engine, it had gas, it had brake, it had a steering wheel. Everything you would need, but it just didn't necessarily have, like, a very well-engineered design in terms of, as I said, those racing go-karts are made in a way that they're hard to flip over, they're designed to take turns well. Well, whoever had just kind of welded this cage onto this, like, lawnmower engine didn't really think about that because it was high off the ground and the lawnmower engine was raised up in the back, so it was very top heavy and tall which meant that it was just very easy to flip over and so on Christmas we're over at Red's house and his dad is giving us this speech about like hey you guys got to be careful you know this thing will flip over only two people in it at a time I know there's three of you but don't let all three of you get in it you know don't do any sharp turns don't do any jumps because like it's not made for that it's made for getting around you guys can use it blah 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 and gave us some pretty strict rules and those are all very responsible rules if if it's already a little bit top heavy, the last thing you want us doing is cramming into it as much as humanly possible and doing sharp turns. That definitely is not an ideal situation and I get it, two at a time, blah 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 blah, like all those rules make sense. The only issue is um, our parents weren't exactly with us all the time when we would use the go-kart. And obviously we would get around the corner and then be like, okay, everyone get in. Because one of us wasn't going to walk along while the other two were in the go-kart. And I'm not saying that was the smartest decision I've ever made. There's a reason that the story ends with us kind of like distancing ourselves friendship wise. But what I can say is we didn't really listen to the rules. We were constantly like taking it out into this desert trail that we had behind our house and jumping it. We were driving it for like the first two days and after that I ended up having to go out of town and visit my grandpa who lived out of state at the time. And so I was gone for a bit. And while I was gone, Red and Green kept goofing off in the go-kart, learning how to do new things, finding jumps, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't know about any of this because I didn't have a phone at the time. They didn't have a phone. It was just like a, not an era where everyone had an iPad. So I didn't really know what was up. But I come back and they pull up in the go-kart to my house as we're unpacking. And they're like, dude, we have to show you something. We discovered something awesome in the go-kart. And uh, I look at my dad and my dad's like, all right, have fun fun but be careful and remember you know don't overload it because he knew uh, Red's dad so he had kind of gotten like the same little rundown on the rules and whatnot and I said okay I grab my skateboard and I start following them down around the corner and we get down around the corner and they go dude we found something new we can do with the the go-kart it's so much fun oh you got to try it it's a really good time it's sick and I'm thinking all right maybe they found a spot in the desert where they were building jumps maybe they found a straightaway where they could go fast something along those lines because that was what would be fun to me. I didn't really expect what they said was a really good time because it just wasn't. They said, we've been flipping the go-kart. And I look at them like they're crazy because that's probably the craziest thing I've ever heard. Why would you purposely be flipping something that you're driving? I mean, maybe for some people that sounds like a good time, but I feel like every time I've been watching a truck race or something and something starts flipping, it's never on purpose and it's never something someone wants to be doing. And especially in this go-kart that's already top-heavy and like doesn't have have a, a super intense roll cage on it. There's no seat belts. I'll be honest, the idea of rolling this thing and flipping it on purpose just sounded like being stuck in a metal death trap. So I wasn't exactly jumping at the idea of getting involved with this. So I'm like, I don't really know how to feel about that. It doesn't seem too fun. I don't really know if I want to. And they're like, okay, okay, just watch. So I take a step back, they get in the go-kart, they start tearing up. And when they get close, Red cuts the wheel hard left and it flips. 
and it like rolls onto its side and it slides for a bit and it makes this ugly scraping sound just metal against the concrete and then I just hear laughing and I look and they're both giggling their heads off and listen from where I was standing it didn't look fun maybe this is just me not trying to get a Darwin Award but I told them yeah I mean I'll watch but I don't want to flip I really don't want to flip in it I don't think it's a good idea I don't want to and they're like oh come on quit being a baby and I'm like look you can call me a baby I don't want to uh, because it just looked insanely dangerous I just did not want to be involved no thanks so whatever they just kept flipping it over and over and over and I'm just kind of standing there watching it and after a while I get bored and I'm like all right I'm gonna go inside and play some video games you guys have fun and they're like all right bye you're still a wimp for not wanting to flip it whatever I go inside and my mom goes, are they safe on that go-kart? And uh, obviously, I'm not going to snitch on my friends, even though they were doing stupid things. It's not like I'm going to tell my mom I wasn't doing anything. So I say no, because the last thing I want my mom to do is tell their mom they're being unsafe. Da -da 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 -da. And my mom's like, okay, we'll just be careful. And uh, at the time, I was really into Madden. It was Madden 09 with Brett Favre on the cover. I remember because I was playing my like superstar character. I made a character I was playing through his seasons. And uh, I'm playing this game, and I hear like a, the doorbell ring I hear my mom answer it and I hear her coming upstairs and she comes in and she says hey uh, your friends are outside they want you to come back outside and I'm kind of like "Ugh, I don't want to flip this stupid go-kart I don't say that out loud but I know that they're about to convince me to do it again and I just don't want to it seems like a stupid idea I'm not interested so I go downstairs and I see them and they're like, we're not going to, we're not going to do that thing because my mom's standing there. So they can't say we're not going to flip the go-kart. They said, hey, we're just going to go explore the desert. And so I was a little bit more interested in that. So I go out to the garage. I get my bike because we had like a mountain bike type of thing. And uh, I start following them in the go-kart down to the desert. And there was this spot down to the right around the corner from my house where there was this big fence that somebody had cut open that you would go through to get to the desert. And when we get there, they say, get in, like all three of us are gonna ride. And this was something that we had done before, so it's not like I was scared, but I tell them, like, I don't wanna flip, okay? I do not wanna flip. I'll get in and we can go explore the desert, but don't flip it. Just let me get out. If you want to flip it, like do whatever you want to do, but let me get out. And they both go, okay, okay, whatever. And so I get in and we start going through the desert and we're going down this road and we're probably going, I don't know, this thing couldn't have gone that fast. It was a lawnmower engine, maybe 15, 20 miles per hour, maybe, but like about that fast through the desert. And Red starts being like, we should flip it, we should flip it. I think he thought maybe once we started driving it, my mind would change and I'd be like, yeah, send it. That wasn't happening. I still thought this was stupid. I'm like, no, come on, man, I don't want to. So he's reluctant and he's getting like more intense and trying to peer pressure me. He's calling me a baby. He's getting mad that I don't want to do it. And so like I say, just take me home, bro. Cause listen, I'm not gonna get yelled at like this. Like, you know, when someone is trying to get you to do something and it stops being like a fun friendship way, like it's no longer, ah, oh, Ah, come on, man. It's like, you're being a baby. And you're like, I don't want to do it, dude. Like, you can scream at me and call me a baby. I don't want to be here. But whatever. I'm like, take me home. I don't want to hang out anymore. Just take me home. And they're annoyed, but whatever. I'm insistent that they take me home. So we turn around and we start driving back. And we get to the part where we're going to come back through this gate to, like, get back on the road to the house. And when we come through the gate, Red slams on the gas pedal. And we start flying forward. And I guess it wasn't weird to go fast, but just something about the way he did it made me and green both go like what are you doing and the way that we're sitting is it's red on the left in the driver's seat me in the middle because i was the smallest and the middle was not really meant to be sat in so i was just kind of like supporting myself up a little bit I, you know what i'm saying and then green on the right and just because it's not made for three people they kind of have to like have their elbows out a little bit and so green and i are like what are you doing what are you doing and red goes we're gonna flip it and we get to where the road is like, you have to come off the sidewalk to get into the road. I don't know if that makes sense, like from this gate thing. And so the go-kart goes off the curb and he cuts the wheel and it flips. And as it's flipping, I just remember looking to my right and realizing that green is like falling out of the go-kart a bit and he's what it's flipping onto. So I adjust a little bit and like put my feet against the right crossbar that was going up. It's a crappy roll cage, but there is a cage on it. And I kind of stop it and I hear it go thump, but we don't slide. And I look and the go-kart is laying on top of green who had fallen out and gotten hit when it flipped. And 
I jump out and I'm like, green, green, are you okay? Are you okay? And red is like, green, are you okay? He's freaking out. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to do that. But basically, as we were flipping, what had happened was green fell out and had like gotten kind of like his bottom half was in, his top half was out. So when it flipped, it landed on top of him and we slid for like an inch. And green is on the ground and he lifts his head up from like where he is. And I will never forget how gross this is. I'm hoping this video doesn't get demonetized, but just road rash down the entire right side of his face. And when I say road rash down the entire right side of his face, I mean, he's looking like Two-Face. And immediately me and Red are like, oh my God, bro, bro, we have to get you to the hospital. Like we got to take you to your parents. And I'm starting to like, be like, we got to get him to his parents now. Like we got to get out of here. And then Red, for whatever reason, realizes that he's going to get in trouble for this. And he's like, no, we don't have to tell him. We can just like clean it ourselves. And I look at Red and I look at Green, who is looking like Two-Face from Batman at the current moment. And I say, there's no way we're going to be able to keep this a secret. There's just no way. Like even if we were makeup experts, half of his face is missing, bro. Like, there's no way that we're going to be able to keep this a secret. And on top of it, even if we could, he probably needs to go see a doctor. Like, he needs to go see someone. He needs he needs help, bro. Like, this is not okay. And Red's reluctant, and he's like, well, I'll take him. I'll take him. I'll say we flipped it. But you go home and just say you weren't with us because if there's three people, then we broke multiple rules and I'm going to get in more trouble. And I look at Green and I'm like, Green, uh, do you need me? And he goes, no, I agree. My parents will be more mad if there was three of us too. So they both agree that I should just dip out. And they're like, don't tell anyone you're with us because we're going to tell them that we flipped it and that's how he got hurt. And listen, I'm younger than them. I looked up to them a lot. And, and like, should I have kept it a secret in retrospect? Probably not. But at the time, I was just going to keep my mouth shut and go home. I was fine. I don't know why I wasn't injured. Red wasn't injured. Like, we were okay. So I go home. I come inside. And my mom's like, how was it? Awesome. The desert was great. I, like, go upstairs as fast as possible, get on my PS2, and I start playing Madden, trying to just avoid my parents. I knew if my parents would talk to me, they could tell something was up because I was still freaking out about what had happened. Happened, but I'm sitting there playing games and then I hear the doorbell ring and for whatever reason as soon as the doorbell rings I start getting nervous I'm like ooh, I don't know why I'm nervous But something about that makes me nervous and I hear like a woman talking and I hear my mom talking back And then out of nowhere. I hear my mom very frantically going what what what? And immediately, I just knew that, like, something happened. And I hear doo -doo 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 -doo, someone running up the stairs. And sure enough, my mom, like, flings open the door. Flings open the door so hard, it was like a gust of wind. Like a bird Pokemon when it first learns gust, bro. I, I almost flew away. You, what do you mean the go-kart flipped and you were on it? Are you crazy? I told you not to be on it with three people. You're such an idiot. Why would you do that? We told you not to. We have those rules to keep you safe. Da -da 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 -da. And I'm just looking at my mom and pure panic, pure panic, bro, because I didn't plan on getting caught. It wasn't in my plan. And in my stupidity, this was dumb. I shouldn't have done it. I try to just deny it. And I go, ah, I don't know what you're talking about. And my mom goes, well, Green's mom just came over here with him and showed me the half of his face that he's going to have to go to the hospital for right now. So you better start explaining what actually happened if you ever want to be able to hang out with them again. And at that point, I'm like, oh, crap. And the first thing I asked my mom is, is Green okay? Because the last time I had seen him, he had just told me to shut up. And my mom's like, they're going to the hospital because it's, it's a really bad road rash. And they think he might have a concussion. And they want to know what happened from you. Because obviously, Red is going to try to save his butt because it's his go-kart. And at that point, I didn't want to snitch. But it was, like, too serious for me to not explain what had actually happened happened like it just it was just too serious so I start telling my mom I'm like all right they were both flipping the go-kart they were both having a great time us three have been doing it in the desert because we thought it was safe like getting in the go-kart together we know you said not to do three people but we decided to do it on the way back they kept trying to say flip 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 and I kept being like no 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 and then we came back onto the street and he flipped it and then da -da -da -da, and then they told me to come back because they didn't want to get in trouble with the three people and blah 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 blah, blah. and my mom's like okay so let me get this straight basically they said that flipping the go-kart was a ton of fun you didn't want to flip the go-kart all three of you were in it 
Red decided that he was going to flip the go-kart to show you how fun it was. Green fell out because there was three of you in the cart. And I'm like, yeah, basically, that's kind of what happened. Uh, essentially, yes. And she's like, you are never to get in that go-kart ever again. Do you understand me? The fact that you were ever on it in the first place is ridiculous. None of you were responsible for that go-kart. I can't believe they got it for him in the first place. But if you ever get on that again, you will be grounded forever. Do you understand? And like, obviously, she's pissed. I understand why she was so mad. I mean, one of the kids in the neighborhood who lived across the street has like half his face missing at the current point of time. Like, it's just an insane situation. But whatever. The rest of the day is, is very awkward in my house. My mom's pissed because I tried to keep it a secret. My dad's like, you're an idiot because your mom's pissed. It's just not a good situation. Uh, a day later, though, Green's mom comes over and she talks to me and she's like, what happened? So I tell her the same story and I ask how Green is because I'm curious. I don't want him to be injured. Obviously, none of us would like this situation to end up how it ended up. And she says that he's going to be okay. He probably won't have any permanent scarring. And he had a concussion, which is like... Considering the injury, he got really lucky. I'll be honest, there's a moment right when we flipped where I was like, oh my gosh, I think he might not get up. Like, it was insane. It was a very hard slam. So the fact that he was going to be okay was great news. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, I can't believe that Red was, like, trying to get us to cover it up. It was a very serious thing. I don't know. We were really little kids at the time. Probably too young to be driving a go-kart, to be completely honest. Like, I don't even think any of us were in the double digits yet, just cruising around on a go-kart. But either way, um, obviously his mom thanked me, she leaves. And, uh, after that, we really, really very rarely interacted. And when we did, it would be one of the most awkward experiences of my entire life. Just to give you guys an idea of how weird this was. This happened when I was maybe seven, eight years old, like somewhere in that range. Pretty young, right? So they probably were like eight or nine, whatever, a little bit older than me. And uh, obviously, like, it was awkward for a year or two, but you would think at some point it would kind of go back to normal. Like, you can't really hold on to anger you have at somebody from when you were nine because people just change a lot, you know? Like, if somebody was still mad at me for something I did when I was nine, I'd be like, bro, I'm 23 now. Like, you're really going to hold on to that? But for example, even well into high school, if I went to check the mail at the same time Green was checking the mail, like, we would both go to the mailbox... Um, and if he saw me coming out of my house to come check the mail, he would literally, like, start taking evasive maneuvers like I was an enemy soldier in his territory, dude. It, it kind of felt insulting, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, do I have the Black Plague or something? Do I have some contagious disease I'm unaware of, dude? The uh, yeah, super, super flu or whatever it's called? I'm just saying, man, he would literally avoid me, start taking evasive maneuvers, zigzagging, like, walking as fast as possible away from the mailbox. And listen, maybe he just didn't want to interact with me, but, uh, was zigzagging necessary? It's not like I'm an alligator trying to chase you down, literally treating me like I got the bubonic plague. And what really bugged me about that, right, is like, I understand if Green was mad at Red and just wanted to ignore him forever, never interact with him again. The guy literally, like, slammed you on the ground under a go-kart, gave you a concussion. I can understand at that point being like, this friendship has just ran its course. But I don't know why he's taking evasive maneuvers and running away from me, bro. Like, I didn't do anything. I was not behind the wheel. I was just along for the ride. The ride that you guys told me it was gonna be really fun to be on. Oh, no, nah, trust me, Ryan. Flipping, it's a blast. Now you're gonna be mad at me because you got hurt when it flipped? Tisk, 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 my friend. Seriously, though, I, I guess I could understand it. It's just more awkward than anything. Like, even if you really want to avoid your neighbors, there's just only so much you can really do about it. As for Red, uh, we just didn't really interact a whole ton after that either. I think that was more more out of embarrassment than it was him, like, I don't know, uh, really hating me, though. And I kind of realized the whole constantly being peer pressured thing was not my favorite thing in the planet. Like, I kind of realized that anytime he had a bad idea, he made us all go down with the ship, which sucks. You don't want a friend like that, you know? If someone makes bad decisions, let them make bad decisions alone. You don't need to bring the whole crew down with you. I, I do feel a little bit bad for my parents, though, just because they used to get along relatively well with their parents, and after this, it just kind of put the whole situation in a weird position. Probably because Green's parents were mad at Red's parents for buying the go-kart in the first place, and I will be fair, I don't really know if nine-year-olds need to be driving go-karts, bro. That just sounds like the worst situation of all time. Kids can barely, like, ride a bike in a straight line without falling over. You're just gonna give them a motorized vehicle and expect nothing bad to happen. It's a miracle something stupid didn't happen 
that was more dumb or more dangerous. Or even sooner. Like, the fact we were able to operate it safely for a week or two is kind of impressive. Honestly, uh, I, I don't really know what they expected. That was always going to end very stupidly. It's been a while since I've done a scary story time, but I see comments saying when's the next one. So uh, here's the answer to that question today. I think it'll be something you guys enjoy. And uh, be sure to press the like button if you have ever drank H2O before. Yeah, that's right, all of you. And without further ado, let's get into it. All right, I have a cousin who is a very outdoorsy man. He's like one of the dudes who just loves to hike nine days out into the wilderness, stay there for a week, hike back out, and the only thing he takes with him is a knife, just like the most insane outdoor dude ever. And I have like camping gear. I'm not Les Stroud. I'm not Bear Grylls by any means. Like, don't call me Survivor Man, but I've camped before. Like, that's basically my outdoor experience. But whatever, on the 4th of July, we were hanging out out and he was like hey let's go on like a little three-day camping trip thing it'll be really fun we'll hike out into the woods we'll have to drive a bit to go to a place that has woods but it'll be a great time and uh, I was like sure why not went home next day got a couple videos done and was like let's go baby Let let's get this camp on so uh, I go over to my cousin's house and he's got gear and I brought some of my own gear and he's like all right we're gonna drive to a, a state pretty nearby and uh, they have these woods here. We're going to park here and we're going to hike eight hours in. So we're in like a super remote place. And I was like, all right, man, uh, whatever you say. But I did warn him that an eight hour hike for him is probably like a 12 hour hike for me. You know, I'm not saying that I can't do it, but I definitely am not going to be able to just be sprinting up a mountain like, oh, this is a great morning workout. Oh, this is better than cereal. Like, I, I don't know, man. That's just not me. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It would usually take me about six, so I figured eight. And I was like, all right, that's fair. We get in the car and we're driving there and he starts telling me about how the last time that he camped out here and we were going to hike to where he camped last time, there was some things that he had seen that were pretty weird and he was hoping to see them again. Which was not very comforting to me, you know, like I said, I've been camping before but I definitely had never hiked like miles out into the middle of nowhere to just uh, have a good time. And especially if I had ever hiked out into the middle of nowhere and started seeing a bunch of weird things, the last thing I would ever want to do is go back, but I guess my cousin was like, well, whatever. I'm the more experienced outdoorsman. If all uh, else fails, I can just uh, sacrifice Ryan to the wood demon that we're going to be fighting, and it'll all be good. And listen, uh, if that would have happened, I wouldn't have been here, so I didn't get sacrificed to the wood demon. We're all good. Either way, I'm definitely curious as to what he saw, so I asked him, like, well, what weird things did you see? And he just said he would hear weird things at night, and he would wake up, and stuff would be moved around, but nothing would be taken, and, uh... I definitely did not like the sound of that. Like, that's pretty weird. When he said he had seen weird things, I'm thinking more like, oh, I saw an unidentified flying object in the sky, probably a meteor. I didn't realize that he was hearing things at night and things were being moved around. This definitely wasn't making me feel more comfortable, but at the same time, I didn't want to look like a chicken in front of my cousin. I know, everyone's like, wow, you know, I, I would have just let him know I was scared. I'm not afraid to look like I'm scared. Good for you, man. My cousin's very intimidating, and I wanted him to think I was cool. I don't regret it, because it was fun. But yeah, I was freaking out on the inside, but on the outside, I'm trying to play it cool as a cucumber. I'm like, oh yeah, that'd be really cool to see in my mind, though. I really hope that doesn't happen. So, uh, eventually we get to the spot where we're gonna leave the car, so we get out, we get all of our stuff, and he's like, alright, let's go, and we just start hiking. And the hike really wasn't that bad, like, thankfully, I guess he had kind of thought about the fact that I don't have a ton of experience hiking for, like, eight hours with 50 pounds of crap on my back, because it was basically straight. I mean, there was some incline, obviously, but we would go up an incline, come down a decline for a bit, which that part kind of sucked, but it wasn't an insane incline. There was no mountain climbing. I didn't have to, like, climb rocks or anything. It wasn't that bad. We ended up getting there in, like, seven hours. Which, sure, it was slower than he would have gone, but, like, it wasn't as slow as he expected me to be. I was a little bit proud of myself, and, uh, the first thing I noticed when we get to this spot 
is that it is desolate, man. Like, there is nothing around. And that is obvious to anyone who has done this stuff. I'm sorry that I'm a total noob at it. But when you hike for hours and hours into the middle of nowhere, it's insane how desolate it is. And it's really, really weird how, like, quiet it is. Not absolutely silent, you know, but it's weird that you don't hear cars, you don't hear planes really you don't really hear anything from like the human world which for people that spend a lot of time in the woods is probably like no duh that's why it's so great but i had never really been in a situation where it was this desolate before so uh we start setting up the camp and there's this little clearing and as we're setting up the camp my cousin is like all right so here's the plant there's a, a creek about da -da 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 that way so we'll go get water after we set up camp and after that, I figured we'd set up a fire, cook dinner, and just get a good night's rest because we hiked all day. And I'm like, all right, that's fine with me. So we set up the camp, and that probably takes us about an hour. And we had decided to just bring a two-person tent just because it was easier to not have to lug a one-person tent each. So we get that all set up. We set up everything, and uh, we take our food. We throw it up over a tree just in case any bears decide to come 1v1 us. Notice how I said 1v1, all right? Because my cousin is the one that's going to be taken on the bear. He would have gone full Leonardo DiCaprio in The Revenant, man. I would have been standing there like, bear, bear, bear. That's a joke, obviously, I would try to help my cousin if a bear attacked, but we just wanted to avoid it. So we put our food up in the tree and we start going down to this creek with our, like, jugs of water, like these big containers of water, and we had brought water purification tablets. So we go down to this creek, we get the water, and it was maybe a 15-minute hike away from the site, which meant that it was just far enough away where it was out of eyesight. We couldn't really see it anymore. And we're getting the water and we come back up, and the first thing that we both notice as soon as we get back to the camping site is that things have definitely been shifted around a little bit. Not a ton, it's not like everything's all flipped upside down, like something an animal had rampaged through our site, but definitely enough for us to notice that things had been moved. For example, like, it, this is really weird, I swear, bro, I don't understand. Maybe he had someone out there pranking me, bro, I still don't know. Our sleeping bags had been, like, on certain sides of the tent, and we had had all of our stuff, and just our sleeping bags had switched sides. All of our stuff was still on the sides we had left it on, just to confirm that that's how we had set it up before we left and now the sleeping bags are switched on top of that like coolers were just flipped around like we had the openings facing towards where we were going to be sitting so they would be easier to open they were like not full of anything yet because we had left the food up in the tree you know but we had just kind of situated them that way and they were flipped around so that was weird and i started to panic a little bit in my brain i still wasn't gonna outwardly panic until i saw my cousin's reaction but in my mind i'm like oh i don't want to stay here bro like i'm ready to put my pack on and hike back out i'm really not trying to be dealing with this whatsoever i know it's probably a bad idea to hike that much at night but i'm not really trying to stay here after what's already going down and my cousin looks at me and he seems a little bit freaked out like I can just see it in his face and he goes okay that's definitely definitely really weird and I just say like what should we do because I don't really know what we should do and I'm really hoping he's gonna say we should leave and he looks up and he says well I don't really want to stay here but it's definitely too uh, dark to hike back so we're gonna have to stay the night and immediately I just get this bad feeling in my stomach like oh man I really do not want to have to deal with this this is not gonna be pleasant I don't really know what's gonna go down tonight but I just have a bad feeling and I'm like are you sure we're gonna be safe if we do that and he says yeah yeah for sure but the way he says yeah yeah for sure is like mm, I don't know hopefully and so uh, we kind of just set up camp, we make a little fire, we make food, and the entire time you can tell both of us are insanely paranoid because our head is just like consistently on a swivel. Not that it's ever in a fantastic idea to totally let your guard down when you're in the middle of nowhere, but you know when you're just like feeling like you're being watched so you're just way too aware of everything going on around you. Every little noise, every time a bird would fly, we both like snap our heads towards that direction and it's obvious we're both freaked out and we're just kind of avoiding talking about it because it almost felt like and this makes no sense I just didn't want to talk about it because it felt like if I said anything about it I was gonna like you know make it angry I don't know what it was I just did not want to talk about it so we're just kind of talking about life and whatnot and it had been a long time since I had spent time with my cousin so uh, we're talking and the conversations good as long as like you know nothing's moving obviously it takes us a little bit to get through conversations because we're both pretty paranoid but it was a pretty good time I'm talking to my cousin 
And uh, by the time that we kind of finish food, get everything all like packed up again, throw the food back over the tree, it's dark now. And we are out in the middle of nowhere, so it's like dark, dark. And we're both starting to get insanely tired because we had hiked all day. So uh, we decide to go in the tent, put out the fire, and just like go to bed, get it over with, and hike out first thing in the morning. And we had just kind of avoided talking about it, but the air was that we were both scared. And I was more scared because my cousin was scared. Like, this was a guy that did this all the time. This was literally his thing, bro. Dude could probably have a show on the Discovery Channel. And he was ready to hike out first thing in the morning. That didn't make me feel more comfortable about the situation. But whatever, we get into the tent. And uh, one of the first things I noticed is my cousin has like a giant knife up by his pillow. And maybe that's something he does all the time, but I kind of was like, oh, all right, it's like that. So I get my knife, not very large, and just keep it by my pillow just because I don't know, man. I'm already freaked out. I would rather just be safe than not be safe. I don't think I'm going to have to use it. But it was more peace of mind than anything. And uh, I start trying to go to sleep, and I just can't sleep at all. My anxiety about the situation is uh, pretty high and what really sucked is it was like my body was exhausted I really wanted to sleep but my brain was just like nah I'm not gonna let that happen I think everyone's been in that situation you know like you ever been uh, in a moment where you have to wake up early the next morning and you're trying to go to sleep the night before, but your brain's like, I'm just gonna keep you up till 5 a.m. because I hate you. So I'm just laying there insanely paranoid, and I finally fall asleep. It's probably like 2, 3 in the morning at this point, and uh, as soon as I fall asleep, I hear something. And my eyes open up, and immediately I see my cousin sit up. So I sit up too because I'm like, oh, alright, it's going down, you know? If we're all springing up from our sleep here, something's happening. And immediately, we look at each other, and we're both being quiet so we can hear what it is, and it sounds like something is walking towards the tent. Slowly, but it's definitely something moving towards the tent, and I don't know how to explain this, but it just sounded like, like a person walking towards us, something on two legs. Just the way that it was moving, the speed, like the, I, I don't know how to explain it, it just didn't sound like it was an animal walking towards the tent. And so we're listening to it get closer and closer to the tent, and we're both just wide-eyed staring at each other, and then back out of the tent, and then at each other, and back out of the tent. And there had uh, been, like, potential rainstorms in the area when we had left, so we had put the rain cover over the tent, so we couldn't see anything. Like, we are in the tent, all we can do is hear this thing walking up to the tent. And it feels like the longest, probably 30 seconds of my life, as this thing is just getting closer and closer to the tent, and it gets right outside of the tent, like, the footsteps are as close as it can be, and it just stops. And no other sound happens, it's just apparently standing right outside the tent, so my cousin looks at me, and he puts his finger over his lips to say, like, be quiet, and he didn't have to tell me to be quiet, I wasn't gonna start yelling out, like, hey man, come on in, we're having a slumber party. No, whatever is outside in the woods, in the middle of the night, as far away from the road as we are, walking up to tents silently, I do not want to interact with whatsoever, even if it's a nice guy, it's not a nice situation you're putting me in. But we just are sitting there quietly and like I have my hand on my knife just in case whatever it is starts trying to come into the tent. And as we're sitting there, whatever's outside the tent isn't trying to unzip the entrance or anything. What I see is just like two shapes kind of pushing in on the side of the tent. And it's very obviously like hands kind of pushing into the tent and pulling down. I don't know. If you've ever seen someone kind of push on that type of fabric before, it's just kind of obvious when there's something putting pressure on it. And so whatever's outside is pushing on the tent and kind of sliding its hands down. And at this point, I'm probably two inches away from pooping my pants, and I know a lot of people are like, Oh, I wouldn't even have been scared. I would have been hyped. Well, good for you, bro. I was freaking out because we're in the middle of nowhere and this thing just walked up to our tent and is now just putting its hands on the sides and rubbing it down the side. And if you've ever, like, felt that tent fabric, you know that if you push it and kind of slide your hands down, it makes that, like, shh noise as your hand is sliding down. And that noise is kind of just sliding down the tent. And me and my cousin are just staring at this movement down the side of the tent. And it gets down to about our eye level, and then it just stops. 
and my cousin and I are still just quiet, not reacting at all. We didn't know if there was like a lot of people outside the tent. We don't even know what it is. Either way, we're not about to let it know that we're awake. We don't want to get into a fight. And the last thing either of us is going to do is get outside of the tent right now. I've seen enough scary movies to know that you never leave the location where it appears to be safe. If it wants to come into the tent, there's two of us. I, I like our chances better in the tent than just like, oh, I'll try to fight whatever is out there by myself. But we are just crapping ourselves. I'm like sweating, dude. My heart is racing. I literally was like, oh, I'm going to die. This is, this is how it goes out. And after it takes its hands off the tent once it's at our eye level, it doesn't walk away. It's just standing there. And so the suspense is literally like you could probably cut it with a knife, just that in the air, just tension. And finally, it's standing out there for probably two minutes, but it just feels like eternity because we're waiting for it to walk away. And we hear it take like three steps away. And then we hear some of our stuff being shifted around in the camp. And it's not insanely loud, but at this point, we're so on edge. Our adrenaline's rushing so hard that, like, you know, you get into that mode where you can just pay better attention to things. You're just noticing every minute little detail. And I'm just hearing things kind of get shifted and dragged along the dirt. And we still don't really know what to do. It's the middle of the night. It's pitch black outside. We don't know what it is, how many of them there are. We're just sitting here just waiting for it to leave. And after probably another five minutes of shifting around our stuff, we hear the footsteps leaving the camp. And after an hour of just sitting there in the silence, not wanting to make any noise just in case it was like nearby or something or it had faked walking away just to see if we would come out of the tent, my cousin looks at me and whispers really quietly, like, what was that? And I look at him like, dude, you're the one who spends all your time in the woods. You think I'm going to be the expert on whatever that was? You told me that this was going to be a great time. You said some things were weird went down. You didn't tell me that there was going to be something trying to break into the tent in the middle of the night. No offense, but I probably would have said no to coming with you if you would have been honest with me about what was going to happen when I got here. Being haunted by a wood demon was not on my uh, bucket list. But I tell him, I don't know. I don't know. Like, what do you mean you don't know what that was? And he just gives me this look and says, says in all of his time being out in the woods he had never seen or been involved in anything like that before and listen I don't know if he was messing with me if he was messing with me then he also is not only a good like woodsman or whatever you would call it but he's also an incredible actor because the guy was talking in a way where his voice was shaking with fear which did not instill more confidence in me like I thought this dude was basically as I don't know, oh, I'm gonna just go out in the woods and build a cabin with my bare hands. And here he is shaking, being like, I've never seen anything like that before. And we're whispering back and forth, and I don't know what it is, so I say, well, what do we do? What do we do? And he says, well, I'm not going out of the tent until it's daylight. And I say, well, I'm not either, man. I'm not trying to go out there by myself. And so he says, we should probably just stay in here and wait. And so we sat in the tent in basically silence, only whispering anytime we would hear something or whatnot for like the next two hours, waiting for the first crack of sunlight to come up. And even when the first crack of sunlight started to be visible, neither of us wanted to really go out there because there was nothing making any noise. No birds chirping, we didn't hear any movement, like it was like the entire world around us had gone insanely silent. Which, I don't know if it was just too early in the morning, but usually as soon as the sun starts coming up, you start to hear, like, birds and whatnot, but it was just quiet, like, eerily silent. And, uh, as the sun came up more and more, when it finally was, like, fully up, sun fully blaring, we decided to come out of the tent. And we step out of the tent, and we didn't even really have to talk to each other, we immediately knew what we were going to do. We were gonna first take inventory of everything that had been moved around, and then pack it up and leave as fast as humanly possible. And I'm telling you, man, everything in our camp had just been moved around. Like, nothing had been taken. No food, no, no gear, nothing was stolen. Everything had just been moved, like, flipped upside down, taken to the other side of the camp. I don't know, whatever was out there in the woods just felt like terrifying people or what, but it had walked up to our camp, touched our tent, and then just decided to just rearrange everything and not take anything. Like, if it was just some crazy dude out in the woods, you think he would have scavenged our gear or something taken it if he's out here living in the wilderness by himself but no it just moved all of our crap around and so we're really freaked out because it didn't even take anything
anything. It was almost like whatever had come up to the tent was trying to scare us. Like that was literally all it was trying to do. It wasn't trying to steal anything. It was just messing with us. So that didn't make us any more comfortable. And we start packing up everything as fast as we can, man. Like I, I usually like to pack things pretty quickly. I don't like to spend a lot of time packing. That being said, I was in overdrive, bro. I took the juggernaut drink for packing. I was just throwing stuff in the backpack. I didn't care if it really fit that well, man. I would carry some of it in my hands if I had to. We're just shoving crap in bags and getting everything packed up. And finally, after probably like 20 minutes of just throwing stuff into our bags, we finally have everything. And my cousin's like, are you good? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And we just start hauling it back towards the car. And thankfully, my cousin was pretty good at navigation. So I'm just kind of following him. And we weren't running through the woods. Like, obviously, we're not Usain Bolt out here just sprinting through the woods like we're experts. But we're, we're going pretty quick. We're going as fast as we can. We're not taking a lot of breaks. We're like drinking water as we're walking. We're just trying to get it done. And the hike that had taken us seven hours to get out to is on track to probably be done in about five hours. We were really picking up the pace. And my cousin's like, man, we're making great time. But about two and a half hours into this hike back out to the car, everything in the woods goes silent again. And up to this point, like there had been, you know, birds chirping, like you can see squirrels squirrels on trees and whatnot. All of a sudden, everything goes just dead silent. And my cousin looks at me and just signals like, stop. So I stop and I'm like whispering to him, what? And he says, everything just went quiet. That's weird. That usually means something's around. So I start looking around. Not that I'm going to find anything. I don't even know why I'm looking around, bro. I'm like, oh yeah, no dude, trust me. I'll scan the tree line. I'll figure it out. Yeah, what am I going to do? Anyways, as we're looking around, we hear a branch break about 20 feet behind us. And my cousin just yells, run and starts running and listen he's supposed to be the expert of the woods mr snow white able to like sing to the animals and whatnot so when he yells run and takes off i don't really know what's going on all i know is i'm not about to be sitting here not running because i feel like that's how i end up in like a, a missing 411 video his cousin ran, and Ryan was never seen again. I'm not trying to go out like that, all right? I'm not trying to die to the wood demons. I'm going to die like 87 years old of some weird disease that doesn't exist yet. Either way, we are just running through the woods now as fast as we can. The terrain is, like, pretty forgiving. I lost my footing a couple times. I'm able to recover it, but we're just running. And I don't stop running until my cousin stops running. And this guy can run for a while. And we're probably sprinting for about 15 minutes. And for those 15 minutes, I wasn't looking back because I knew that was going to slow me down. And we also didn't really hear anything behind us. I don't know why we kept running forever, probably just to get out of that situation as far as we could. But we finally, like, run for 15 minutes and my cousin stops and he's out of breath and I'm out of breath and we're breathing heavy. And we start drinking water and we're like, what was that, man? Like, what do you think that was? And I ask him why he was so scared and he goes, honestly, it probably would have been a bad idea to run if that would have been, like, a bear or something bad idea. But he just said that, like, a wave of fear washed over him and the only thing that his brain could do was just like say run and take off which this guy wasn't really afraid of love a lot like as long as I've known him which is a while he's my cousin I had never really seen him get shaken up by anything so the fact that he's sitting here being like dude I don't know I just had an overwhelming uh, feeling to run didn't calm me down indefinitely. I was glad that we took off because like he was the type of guy that would purposely stay in situations a little bit too long because he was just so chill and like not scared. The type of guy to be like if a, a rhino was rushing him, just stare it down and be like, it's going to stop. Trust me. So the fact that he had freaked out and started running made me be like, oh yeah, we were mere inches away from death. Not that we were or whatnot, but we just definitely, definitely both felt like we needed to get out of there. And we're still probably about two hours or so away from like being back to the car. And at that point, we kept up the pace. We were going like a little bit faster than our normal pace, which was hard to keep up with him for a bit. But at the same time, I wasn't really trying to stick around here anymore. It became obvious to both of us that whatever had been messing with us at the camp last night had been following us. 
just because it hadn't chased after us, we assumed that it had to have been something like that. Everything had gone quiet. If it would have been a bear or something, like the last thing you're supposed to do is run. So we both had just kind of assumed that whatever had messed with us at the camp had been following us and it just happened to freak us out enough for us to sprint and hadn't followed us. But we weren't trying to stick around and let it catch up or figure out what it was for another night. So we're just hauling it through the woods and we're like keeping our voices down but still talking to each other and I'm asking him what do you think it is what do you think it is and he just doesn't have an answer for me and usually this guy is Mr. Logical Explanation so that wasn't calming me down either and finally we get to the point where we could hear the road and we start picking up the pace even more kind of jogging a little bit and we get to the car and he says just throw your stuff in the back so I throw my stuff in the back I hop in the car and we peel out of there and my cousin is driving like he's in a GTA server a little bit he's going like 50 and like a 30 and so I tell him to relax slow down and he goes sorry I'm just scared I'm scared and I'm like what are you scared of and he says I think I saw something following us for that last little bit but I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to freak you out which, listen, if you didn't want to say anything, you just shouldn't have said anything ever, bro. I really didn't want to hear that. I was already freaking out enough, and he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, I saw something following us, but didn't want to tell you. Well, now I know we were still being followed, and he said that, like, it had kind of started approaching the car. That's why he had just said, throw the stuff in and go, and he just wanted to get out of there. And so I'm like, what was it, you know? And he said it just looked like a dude, but it looked like a dude that had been in the woods for a really long time. Looked like his clothes had just been through the ringer just beat to crap and whatnot maybe he was just some guy like uh, trying to hide from something I don't know maybe he was just one of those dudes that has enough go lives in the shack in the middle of the woods either way I was not trying to hang out and uh, mess around and I'm glad my cousin just got us in the car and got us out of there very very thankful he didn't go stupidest person in a horror movie mode and like go investigate it last thing I want to do is have to explain to my aunt why my cousin was eaten by a pack of wild cannibals in the woods and uh, once we were in the car, we just literally drove until we like hit this town. And my cousin and I pulled over into this motel because we hadn't slept the night before. We had hiked back out. We were literally exhausted. We get a room and we just passed out, man. I had never slept that good in a very, very long time. I will say that. Like, very thankful. If there's one good benefit out of all of this, I slept like a baby in that motel, all right? The bed sucked. It didn't even matter. We just needed a cheap place to sleep because we were exhausted. We both passed out. We slept. I, I had some pretty freaky dreams, obviously, about... Felt like being camping in the woods and being watched not very swag I don't think I had a vision or anything I think my brain just concocted a nightmare because of the situation that my cousin had apparently just decided to keep from me either way we wake up and my cousin's like ready to go I say yes we hop in we drive home we get back and our family is kind of like you guys are back way earlier than we thought you were going to be and we're like yeah we tell them the story they are definitely shaken up but my dad thinks we're messing with them he's like ah oh, yeah sure you guys are just pranking us probably couldn't handle out there being in the woods because you're so addicted to cell phones ha 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 you know boomer joke you, you really zinged me dad either way uh we were like no i swear i swear and so uh we have another uncle that's kind of like the crazy conspiracy theory guy i've told stories about him before on this channel and of course he starts talking about how like yeah there's all these civilizations that live out in the woods and they don't like visitors so if you go out there they'll come mess with your stuff to teach you a lesson and i don't necessarily believe that but i don't really know what it was bro i didn't see anything maybe my cousin could have just been messing with me maybe he had a friend out there i don't know either Either way, bro, I was just happy to get out of there. There's something really unnerving about seeing someone that you, like, respect a lot and think very highly of, especially when it comes to just being tough and not afraid of anything, start to be shaken up and freaking out. Does not add confidence to the situation, dude, but I'm proud of myself for just hiking out of there, man. Adrenaline and fear is one hell of a motivator. Usually in that situation, I'd be so winded, I'd be like, I'm so tired. The fear of being eaten by whatever is following us, though, definitely makes Made me be like oh this is easy man I could run forever I felt like the cop from cloudy with a chance of meatballs you know the meme of him running like that was the speed at which I was able to get out of this either way uh, I survived I, I don't know I don't really know how much danger I was in to be honest I still don't really know what it was all I know is it was freaky I was pretty freaked out in the moment still don't really know what it was if anyone has any ideas let me know in the comments section could it have just been like just dude living in the woods I, I don't know man I'm, I'm open to anything I really have no clue 
All I know is that uh, what it really reaffirmed to me is that I'm going to stick to camping in places where people usually camp. Like, I'm not going to go uh, off the beaten path anymore. More power to the people that have the bravery to do it and the skills and whatnot. I'll just stick to camping where people usually camp. I'm not trying to go fight another band of misfit toys, a.k.a. cannibals out in the woods. I've seen enough horror movies to know. You, you think Blair Witch Project was a movie? No, it was a documentary. I'm not trying to end up like that. I'll stick to the well-beaten path in Unless I absolutely have to get off of it. Until then, I'm staying right here. This is the comfort zone. I don't really know what it was. It was weird, though. Either way, guys, I just wanted to remind everyone that if you like these, I do post them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get those. Just look up, like, Scrubs, and it should pop up pretty quick. And, uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the video. All right, so every like five, six years, my dad's side of the family does this big reunion where literally everybody goes. And uh, I had never really been to one before, and one had happened when I was like one, two, three, like one of those ages. And so I think I was eight or nine years old when it ended up coming up, and my dad said that we were going to be heading on down to where his family's from. And uh, I was hyped because he told me that there was going to be like... 30, 40 cousins around my age, and uh, I had only been around like the two cousins I have on my mom's side before this, so I was pretty excited. Anyways, we get there, I meet my cousin, and it's very, very fun, except they are all super hyped for this uh, nerf war that they do every single time that they have one of these reunions. Only issue is the way that they have the team set up doesn't seem very fair. Basically, it's all of the cousins that are like, I don't know, 10 and up versus all the cousins that are 10 and younger. And listen, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with like being young. That being said, it's definitely, definitely a little bit unfair to have, like, a bunch of 14-year-olds in a war with a bunch of, like, 7, 8-year-olds. Something tells me they might not have the tactical know-how. It'd be horrifying, though, if somehow the younger cousins ended up winning this. Like, that's how you know that your family has the next Napoleon in your bloodline right now. You guys are accidentally gonna be reconquering Louisiana with, uh, your relative. Like some seven-year-old just outmaneuvers everyone. Anyways, I wasn't too thrilled on the teams, but there wasn't much we could do about it. So we ended up like loading up our Nerf guns and we had to protect this barn that they had on the property. And uh, listen, while I was taking my mission very seriously, there's only so much you can do when the people A, know where they are and what they're doing and B, are twice your age. I didn't grow up in these woods at all. I had never spent any time like wandering around here. These guys were spending time on my grandpa farm like it was some type of sport dude they were literally here all the time so of course they know how to like be in the ridge line run along the trees where they can't be seen but can still see us all these things that you just learn over time of like goofing off on the land so we end up getting clapped I'll never forget it there was like four of us in front of the barn like garage door thing and we had flipped some tables on their side to use them as cover and out of nowhere, there was this whistling, and I was like, huh, what's that? And I look over, and everybody else looked scared, and that's when I realized something was wrong. And dude, you know the scene from Mulan when they shoot the arrows, and it's just like a literal wave coming down? That's how it felt, except instead of arrows, it was nerf darts, man. It was like the sky opened up, and for two seconds, instead of raining water, it just rained foam. There were just so many nerf bullets. I get behind the table... And, like, Nerf bullets don't go very fast, they're not very loud, but I'm behind this plastic table, and all I hear is, like, as they're hitting into the table. And, obviously, I'm like, what do we do? What do we do? And, uh, my older cousin, who was, like, the oldest person on our team, says, return fire! So we start trying to shoot our Nerf guns back. And it's not really doing anything, bro, because as we start shooting back, they start, like, maneuvering. Except, you know, they're older than us, so they're a lot more capable to maneuver, and it looked like they had practiced this a lot. Because they're just doing hand signals and moving up and, like, a two over here, and then, like, screaming numbers out, and they know what it means. And we just get yeeted and beaded on, and they end up kicking us out of the garage pretty quick. And the rules were that they were going to come take the garage, and then we had, like, three hours to try to take it back. And so we go inside and we're like, bro, we're getting smoked. There's no way that we're going to win this. Like these ages are so unfair, blah, 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 blah. 
And the cutoff for the game was 18. Like, you couldn't be our 45-year-old uncle out here with a thermal sight on your Nerf gun. Like, that wasn't allowed. And one of our cousins, who was, like, 19 years old, super cool dude, had been the most fun to hang out with, showing us around and whatnot. He says that he doesn't think the teams were very unfair, and he remembers being our age, so he's gonna help us. And so he starts helping us, like, plan our assault on the barn. And, uh, obviously our plan was pretty much gonna be, like, run in there. Cause we're just a bunch of young kids, there's no planning. And he starts telling us that we've gotta be careful and, like, take out the guards and blah 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 blah. And then he says something that I think we were all very excited to hear. He said that we needed the element of surprise. And so we're trying to think about how we can surprise them. We don't really know how we're going to do it. Because they basically know that we're going to have to come take the barn. Like, if we actually want to play in the game, there's no way around it. We have to take the barn. And so he says, well, I know how we can surprise them, but only if you guys are down to let me help you. And obviously, we're down to let you help us. You're helping us plan this. Come on. And he says that there's a golf cart that has these doors on it that can close up. So that way, if it's raining, they can still drive it. And the windows roll down. And so what he was going to do is it's in the garage, pull around front. We were going to get in it. And the roof had this sunroof thing. And we had one of those, like, Nerf miniguns. They don't shoot very well, but, you know, we had one. And he said that we should get up in that golf cart and make like a little technical type of thing. And for those of you that don't know what a technical is, it's just like a truck with a machine gun in the back. But we were basically going to use this golf cart to make ourselves a little moving tank with this Nerf chain gun thing that we had. So we say, yes, this is a great idea. We go out into the garage. They can't see us. Like the way the barn and garage are positioned, you can't see into the garage from the barn. And we start messing around with this. And we don't need to like put anything on it. It's only Nerf bullets at the end of the day. So the normal stuff will be fine. We just end up taking some paracord and like tying the legs of this little Nerf machine gun down so it won't slide off the top. And then we had the older cousin who was uh, the oldest person on our team. He was going to man it. And then we had the rest of the older cousins, which was me and three others. And we were going to be sitting in the side, like shooting out the window. And we all got in and my cousin was like, all right, the older one who was driving. Okay, you guys know the plan. We're going to ride by. You guys have to just open it up, you know, try to hit them. If we miss them, it's still okay because it'll catch them off guard and they'll move. And so we're like ready to go. And he gets in and he starts up the go-kart, bro. And obviously in retrospect, it's not a big deal to just kind of ride past someone in a go-kart and shoot them with a Nerf gun. But at the time, dude, little kid me, I had butterflies in my stomach. I basically felt like I was going to a, a Navy SEAL mission. At the time, you think this stuff is the coolest ever. Like, yes, in retrospect, it is just a Nerf war. It is just an older cousin trying to help. But when you're in that moment, you're like, okay, this is very serious. No messing around anymore. I'm, I'm going to have to man up. I'm going to war. Like nine years old, ready to go. So whatever, we start rolling towards him. And the way that he was going to do it is go pretty fast and then cut the engine and drop it into neutral so he would just roll up that last little bit. And so we get going a little bit. Sure enough, he turns it off, cuts off the lights. We start rolling. And we get probably like eh, 30 feet away from this barn door. And there's like three people outside. And as soon as we get close enough, my cousin gives us the signal, which was just turning on the floodlights. And we start letting foam fly in return. Yeah, that's right. I used to cower in fear on the other side of that plastic table. But now it is me blasting the foam into the plastic table, you know, just feeling silly. And they're freaking out. They're like, what in the world? They got a tank. They got a tank. And we're just do 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 And finally, obviously, Nerf guns only carry so much ammunition, so we run out. My cousin says, get in. We, like, uh, pull our older cousin back in from the roof. And, uh, we just get out of there. And thankfully, I don't know how, and, like, the, the fear of it all, I don't think any of them had even really shot back, or if they did, it didn't get in. I had not rolled up my window, or rolled down my window all the way. I had kind of put my little Nerf gun in it, and then rolled it up so there wasn't much room to fire back in. But whatever, we're all sitting there, and we're like, all right, I think we did it. But while we were sitting there, the rest of our little army, like, the rest of our younger cousins, a few people our same age, they started running up, and, like, we're continuing continuing the assault. So we re reload our little Nerf guns and we run up and we start helping them too. And uh, it had gotten dark at that point. So I had remembered I took some electrical tape and I like put the cheap little like Walmart flashlight on the end of my Nerf gun and just tape, 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 tape. And I turn it on. And I remember as soon as I turned the light on, I just saw one of my cousins walking out of the barn who was older and on the other team. 
So I just shot the Nerf gun because I was like, oh, he's on the other team. And it just literally went and like bounced off his cheek. And he must have been having a bad night or something. Because he looked at me and was like, I'm out already. And I was like, okay, man, listen, it's an accident. Believe it or not, in a Nerf war, I have no way to tell if you've been hit or not, bro. If you're just walking out of the bar and your arms aren't up or anything, what do you want me to do? He gets really mad. He's yelling that, like, this wasn't fair because we got to use a golf cart, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you know what else isn't fair? Having teams that consist of a bunch of seven-year-olds and then people that can probably drive a car already. It's not our fault you didn't think about using the golf cart. You guys just got outplayed. Either way, we kind of storm the barn, and at that point, it's just a numbers game. Yeah, they're a lot older than us, but like half of them are already out, there's a lot of us. And if anything, in the middle of the night, their age kind of plays against them. Think about how horrifying it would be to have like a, a squad of seven-year-olds just storming you in the middle of the night. You thought it was hard to see people in the dark before, now they're half the height. Either way, we storm the barn and we take it, and they're kind of shocked because they've never lost before. Like, they've been doing this at a lot of family reunions, and of course, usually the older kids win. That's why they love the game so much. Because usually they just put the beat down on and they're like, haha, we're better than you. But we take back the barn, which means we win. And so we end up going back inside. And all the parents are kind of giving the older kids some crap. They're like, wow, you guys lost to all your little brothers. Way to go. Just kind of making fun of them. And it's not serious. It's not like anyone was actually upset. But one of my cousins gets all pissed off and he like slaps the table and says, well, if they wouldn't have cheated, then I think we would have won. And that's why that they cheated. And all the adults are kind of confused. And they're like, what do you mean they cheated? So they tell them that uh, we took the golf cart and like went and used it as a little tank. And all the adults start laughing and they're like, that's not cheating. That's just thinking ahead. Listen, bro, if we're playing a war game, I don't know if you know this or not, but sometimes militaries use vehicles, all right? Yeah, we were using Nerf guns, but what? We're just not supposed to use a golf cart? It's not our fault that you guys didn't think about it. Either way, it was really fun. It's like one of my uh, fondest memories of all my cousins. I didn't see them a whole lot. They live like across the country, but it was definitely a really good time. And I did eventually do one more before I was too old for it. I was on the other side. Not nearly as eventful, no go-kart this time, we won. Uh, yeah, this, this was a one-time thing. The upset only happened once, they didn't let it happen again. Alright, so the person who sent this in to me is a little bit older than I am. They're not like super old, but early 30s type of vibe, and they had an older uncle who uh, had some health complications and ended up sadly passing away. And this person was really upset about it because they had been really close when they were young. Since then, he had moved out of state, and so they would see each other at holidays and stuff, and were still close, but it was someone who had a lot of influence on him when he was younger. And so obviously, he comes back for the services and everything, and it also just so happens that this uncle has, uh lived a pretty good life, you know? He had accumulated some things to the point where there was going to be a reading of the will that was a, a sort of a big deal. And the person who sent this in to me didn't expect anything, literally. They were more just there to support their family. But their uncle had asked that they be at the will reading specifically. And uh, their uncle had a ton of stuff, but he ended up giving this nephew of his 15 acres of land. And it's not like it's 15 acres of land in the middle of downtown Chicago or anything, but that's a hefty chunk of land. That's a lot of land. And on top of it, it just happened to be farmland that had been in the family for an insanely long time. And it was a very sentimental plot of land because it was on the family farm, and the family farm was the place that they had spent a lot of time growing up. So it meant a lot to him. However, there was another cousin slash nephew of the uncle that was a working farmer in the area who worked on the other part of the farm. And it wasn't insanely valuable land. So after the will reading, the cousin who farmed on the land came up to him and said, Hey, when you're in the city, would it be okay if I farmed on the land? It could still be your land, but because it's like 15 acres of farmland, could I just you know, rent the land from you to grow crops on? And uh, he was pretty interested in that deal. If you don't take care of farmland, I'm pretty sure it just goes into a state of disrepair and slowly becomes like not as great for farming. So he wanted someone to upkeep it, but he's not a farmer. It would stay in the family, it would go to his cousin, his cousin would have more land to farm on. But his cousin didn't have a bunch of cash, so he agreed to sell it to his cousin for $1, so that way he could own it and farm on it. 
and the deal was that he was always welcome back. His cousin would give him a cut if he ended up selling it to a land developer in the future, and he reserved like a half acre parcel so he could build a house on it. So the deal ended up working out well for everyone, and he figured it was respectful of his uncle to keep it in the family, but he didn't want the farmland to not be used, especially if his cousin could make money on the land, versus it just sitting empty while he lives like states away. And because there was a lot going on, they just kind of did like a, a word of mouth handshake type of deal and said they would figure it out before he ended up going back. And a few days later, he just wanted to go walk around the land, think about his uncle, just have a little bit of a moment with the land that he had spent a lot of time on. I, I don't know, it makes sense to me. You just kind of want to go see it, say, say goodbye to your uncle in a way. Nothing weird about that. So he gets out there and he hops out of the truck and starts walking around and as he's there another truck comes up and it sits there watching him for a little bit and after a while this couple jumps out and both of them just have a Karen vibe. You know when someone just looks at you impatiently? I don't know if you guys can pick up what I'm putting down. But when someone is just giving you a look of like, please hurry up, you're slightly inconveniencing me. And the person who sent this to me is a little bit confused because they're walking on their land, not really knowing who these people are. So they walk up to him and say, hello. And immediately this couple just launches into, are you the nephew that got the land? Which is off-putting because he doesn't know them. And also it means that they know that his uncle passed away. And the first thing they say to him, are you the nephew that got the land? Not like we're really sorry to hear about your uncle, nothing like that. Not that they're obligated to say sorry, but if you know someone's family member just passed away and you know they got land, like you should probably say, hey, I'm so sorry for your loss, da 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 da. Like it's not the time to bug them about their land. It was just weird. So he kind of has a weird vibe, but he says, yes, yes, I did. And they, before he can explain anything else, say, we're going to buy it for $12,000. And even if he would have decided to go sell it, it wasn't massively valuable. It's in a state where, like, things aren't exactly popping. But it was worth triple that. Like, he could have made $40,000 selling this land if he wanted to. He was helping out his cousin. But he was not about to just give it to these people for like a quarter of what it was worth. So he told them, no, that's not going to work. He was selling it to his cousin. And these people that don't own the house aren't related to his uncle or know this guy start freaking out saying that because they live next door, they reserve the right to buy it first. It was the law. And this guy does not know these people at all. He doesn't owe them anything. And that's not a law. I don't feel like it's the rule that if you put your house up for sale, you just have to sell it to what your neighbor offers it. It's just automatically the law. Could you imagine your neighbor puts their house up for sale, you just go over and buy it for one dollar, and they're just like screwed, and now you have two houses? So he tells them, sorry, but their offer was low anyways, so he's not going to sell it to him. He'd rather sell it to their cousin. And the, the guy of the couple at that point tries to like puff out his chest and get all intimidating and says, well, that's what we want to pay for it. That doesn't change anything, dude. That's not exactly how negotiations work. Like you can't walk into a car dealership, to a Lamborghini dealership and say, I want to pay $5 for that. And when they say no, go, well, that's what I want to pay for it. You think they're just going to turn around and say, oh, well, if you, if you would have told us sooner, sir, we would have had it with a bow on it waiting for you. It doesn't matter if that's what you want to pay for it. That's not how it works. The person selling it gets to decide the price. So he just says, sorry. And now they're trying to like guilt trip him because it's not really working on him. He's not going to agree to sell it to them. So they just start saying about how, you know, they've always wanted this land and, and they feel like they deserve it. And he's just thinking to himself, I don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. He's already not in a great mood, but now they're just making everything worse and like making him pissed off when there's supposed to be some nice time on this land. So he just doubles down and says, no, I'm not going to sell you the land. Nothing you can tell me is going to make me sell you the land. So just leave. And they get all irritated and snap back that they're going to be in contact with legal help and he's going to hear back from them. And he says okay and doesn't back down so they get in the car and drives away. 
And one thing that stands out to the guy is that they didn't say they're going to go get a lawyer. They said they were going to go get legal help. That should have been a big red flag. In their minds, legal help is probably just Googling things, but he didn't really care. But as soon as they leave, he calls his cousins about it. And the second he starts explaining them, his cousin says, oh yeah, they're nuts. Because he lived on the other side. Basically, it was the crazy people, the plot of land with his uncle's house, and then this cousin that he was selling the land to. And he starts telling him stories about how they were always causing problems for him and his uncle, and they were always complaining about everything. And he's like, yeah, well, apparently they want to buy the land for this price. And he said, don't sell it to him. Obviously, he wasn't going to sell it to him. So he reassures his cousin and then says that he wished he would have had a heads up. He probably would have tried to roll a little bit more incognito, like not have just gone up and talked to him. But him and his cousin went later that week and got the agreement signed over with like a lawyer saying that uh, it was going to be the cousins to own and operate, da 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 Technically, if they sold it, they would split the profits 50-50 because he was going to maintain it and work on it, and the other guy owned it. It was a whole agreement, and he got his half acre, so they signed that agreement, and now it's officially his cousin's property, like, splitting it. Technically, his cousin had 51%. He can't stay forever there, so he ends up going back to the city in a different state that he normally lives in, and his cousin just goes about farming on the land. He was already farming it because his uncle was old and couldn't take care of it, so literally nothing changed. It was just as if he was still growing the stuff he was already growing. But this Karen couple just starts immediately bothering his cousin now. Anytime he's out working in the field, whether it be with equipment, whether it be like just trying to get stuff done, they just go over and just harass him saying that he's obligated to sell to them and he has to sell to them. And when he asked, like, why do I have to sell to you? Why would I do that? If I've been working on the land my entire life and now I own it, why would I sell it to you when I don't know you? Because of the neighborly code. That was actually their answer. And I've never heard of this neighborly code that they're even talking about. I don't know if it's written down somewhere. Google search didn't help me. But if there is some neighborly code, I highly doubt a part of it is that you have to sell your property to your neighbor for whatever price they want, whenever you want. I don't think that would be legally binding, and it would also be insanely stupid. Could you imagine, dude? You're like, hey, you just have to sell me your house right now. And that rubs the cousin the wrong way because he doesn't want to be told what to do and they're just harassing him about it. He's getting to the point where he doesn't like want to even go work on that part of the field because every time he's there, they come over and start yelling at him about being a bad neighbor because he doesn't want to let himself get scammed because of some made up code of rules that they have. And so finally, one day, he just kind of loses it on him and tells him to take a hike, not too nicely, and says if they ever come back to the property, he's going to call the cops and they're going to be cited for trespassing and he's had enough. They're never going to own the land. No way. Never. It's not going to happen. And they react extremely poorly to that, but they start yelling at him, calling him impatient. And listen, I feel like this would have been a justified response day one. The fact that he had let you guys come up and do this to him multiple times and not started screaming at you shows that he's been extremely patient. I love that now that he freaks out like time 50, he's the impatient one. And they say that they're going to be uh, writing the neighborly code down and sending him letters as if that's going to change anything. But sure enough, letters start showing up at the cousin's house, which is right on the other side, like two streets away, handwritten on notebook paper, saying that if he didn't comply with the neighborly code attached, then they were going to sue him in the neighborhood court. And I love when people start being like, I'm going to sue you in the court of da-da-da-da-da, because there's only one court that matters, all right? It's uh, the United States court, like the state courts, the federal courts. You can sue me in neighborhood court, whatever that is, dude. What are they going to do? Like, get angry at me and not invite me to a barbecue? It's not like anything would be legally binding about a neighbor court, and I don't even know what that would entail. Is it just your drunk neighbor Ted in a powdered wig just trying to conduct court nine beers deep? You're guilty because I didn't like that, and that was not nice. Thank goodness that's not how it works. Obviously, the cousin is just ignoring the letters because it's stupid and he has no reason to listen to it. And then it starts showing up at the subscriber who sent this to me's house. Keep in mind, this person lives in another state. They live in a city, which it's not easy to track people down in. So somehow they had gotten his address. 
And his letter is the neighborly code with a subsection, I don't know if they wrote this code themselves, saying that if the owner of a property lives out of state, he has an obligation to sell it to people who live in the state. And he doesn't even reply, but that's literally what he did. This neighborly code doesn't exist, but he sold it to his cousin who lives in the state. And the way that this stuff was worded was really, really annoying. Because it was like somebody had watched way too much of Law & Order or those crime shows where they say legal jargon but didn't understand what any of it meant. They would say like, you are uh, contractually obligated to do this. And it's like, well they never signed a contract so that's just not how that terminology works. And when the letters didn't work on either of them, they started coming to the door of the cousin with like suit and pantsuits on as a team saying that they were going to be filing a lawsuit and da 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 and now they're using all these legal words wrong in person, which is even more embarrassing. And at one point they told the cousin that if he didn't agree to sell it to them, then he was going to be forced to take a plea deal. And I think plea deals are only for criminal things. I don't think if you sue someone, like, in civil court that they can really, uh, make someone take a plea deal. That's more for crimes, and you can't force someone to take a plea deal. That person has to take a plea deal. I love them. We're just gonna strong arm you into doing exactly what we want in our made up court that doesn't exist. And at that point, he, they've watched too much TV. They're being annoying. Now they're showing up to his house. They had probably doxxed the guy that they were sending letters to. So the cousin and the subscriber decide that they're going to get their own lawyer. And their own lawyer gathers all this stuff and says, okay, next time they come, notify them that if they come again, you're going to report them to the police for the harassment and you've collected everything they've done. So they come back and the cousin says, like, you guys really need to leave us alone. We've gathered everything you've been doing to us and we're going to report you for harassment if you guys ever come back on this property and bother us again. And they blow him off saying that they're not afraid of the police because the police don't enforce the neighborly codes. I don't know what code they're talking about, dude, but I would love to see how that went down. Could you imagine, like, they get pulled over? Excuse me, officer, you're not my neighbor, so therefore you cannot tell me I was speeding. Well, sir, what I can tell you to do is get out of the car. So they try to come back, they contact their lawyer, the lawyer turns in this paperwork, the police come out and talk to the cousin. The cousin says, I don't want him to go to jail, I just don't want them allowed over here anymore. So sure enough, they get like a temporary protective order, which means they're not allowed to step onto this guy's property. And they're freaking out now, they're like posting on Facebook that he's evil and he's trying to work with the police to that silence their political ideology. I don't know what political ideology the neighborly code would be, but whatever. And so they're just losing their minds. Meanwhile, anytime they do try to come back over, it's just gonna end up with them violating a protective order. I wouldn't make up laws and then go harass people, find out people's address, send them threatening letters, show up to their house, and time and time again after they warn you to stop, just keep going, because eventually it's gonna bite you in the butt. And if they do violate that order, I would love to see them get in front of the judge and be like, he wasn't a good neighbor for selling me his house for $3. I just can't believe people like this exist. The person told me they would send me an update if anything happens, so comment down below if you want me to do part two. Just comment part two, but we got more stories today. All right, this next one's crazy. I can't believe people have the audacity to do this, but people were just using his pool when he wasn't home. So the person who sent this to me moved into a neighborhood and I guess the guy who had lived in his house before him had lived there forever and knew everyone really well and this guy wasn't mean to everyone but like didn't know everybody if that makes sense was just a normal person in that regard. But he ended up getting a pool built and he built it for him to enjoy. I feel like that's common sense if you put a pool in your backyard it's not for everybody to enjoy it's for you and your friends to enjoy. But he works a lot, and for the most part, he would come home, go in the backyard, sit by the pool, read a book, swim, and it would seem like everything would be left the way he left it. But he comes home one day, and he's a little confused, because it looks like people were using his pool. 
And the person who sent this to me isn't like insanely OCD, but he lives alone, so it was weird because there were two towels out, and even if he would have forgotten it, it would have only been one. But he doesn't know for sure that someone's been using his pool, like maybe he just left two towels out he can't really remember, so he just brushes it off. But it paranoys him enough where he's like, I'm gonna put a lock on the gate just because, you know, maybe I should anyways, I don't want kids going in the backyard and falling in the pool or whatever. I'm not home all the time, it's better safe than sorry. So he goes, gets a lock, sets the combination to something different than the number I'm about to say, but puts it back to 0000. And that's just something he had done since like middle school on all the locks he had on his lockers and stuff, he would just put it back to those numbers. So he would leave it there, put in the combination, set it back to 0000. That's gonna be important. And so he leaves the next day pretty confident that he's gonna come back and no one will have been in the backyard because I feel like that's just an unspoken assumption. If you leave for the day, you don't expect people to be rummaging through your backyard using your pool. But he comes back and sure enough, there's two towels out again. And now he knows for sure something is up, something's weird because he picked it up yesterday but he knows he didn't leave two out. And he goes over to the lock and he looks and the lock is still on the fence, but its numbers are off. It looks like somebody had tried to unlock it and then probably just hopped the fence. It's not insanely tall. And this happened on a Tuesday. And this guy who sent this to me happened to have Wednesdays and Thursdays off, but most people would assume that the person would still be working Wednesday and Thursday if they're just using your pool while you're at work. He stays up really late that night playing video games, goofing off, not really thinking about getting a super early wake up because it's his day off. It's not like waking up early was number one on his priority list. But he gets woken up at like 10 a.m. from sounds that sound like they're coming from the backyard, which is bizarre because like I said, lives alone. And he looks out the window just being like, what in the world is going on out there? And he can't believe his eyes. He didn't know the neighbors well, but he knew that he lived next to this couple. And the couple is just full on in his pool outside. They have like sodas out, they have a cooler, they're playing music. If you didn't know any better, dude, you would think that this was like a public pool and they were lucky enough to be the only people there for the day. So he's really confused and storms outside, not in the best mood because he just woke up and on top of it, there's strangers in his backyard using his pool and he goes out there and is like, you guys gotta leave, what's wrong with you? You can't use my pool. And they look at him and say, why? Why can't we use your pool? The guy who lived here before would have let us. And the owner of the pool can't believe how stupid of a statement that is because that guy doesn't live here anymore. It doesn't matter if the guy who lived here before would have let you swim in his pool. I'm not that guy, so get out of here. And he explains that it's his pool and on top of that, he really doesn't want people using it when he's not home so they can't use it anymore because they clearly don't respect him if they've been sneaking into the backyard. And he's pretty pissed off while he's explaining this, rightfully so. I think anyone would be pissed in this situation. You catch people swimming in your pool. And they're lucky that he's not, like, gonna do more about it other than just tell him to leave. Like, I would've, I don't know, called the cops, trespassed him, something, I don't know. That's just weird. But they start getting angry with him, being like, why are you so mad? You could be nice about it. What do you want him to be nice about? You sneaking into his property and using stuff while he's not there? And on top of that, you jumped a locked gate. Like, you can't even make the argument that the gate was unlocked. So he says that to him. What would you like me to be nice about? You jumping a locked fence? And they look at him and probably had no reason to keep arguing with him at that point because they don't really offer any explanation. But their response to that is just, well, we want to swim. Well, that's great, man. I want a billion dollars. It doesn't give me the justification to just walk into Fort Knox and take some gold. Uh, it, just because you want something doesn't mean you can go get it. If you want to swim that bad, you get a pool. And so he says, I don't care if you guys want to swim. That's not my problem. You guys can't swim in my backyard, especially when I'm not here. That's weird. And they kind of give him this rant about he could just be nice about it. There was no reason to come out and make a scene and make them feel bad about it. And now they felt weird. And he's like, yeah, you guys should feel weird. This is really weird. Using people's stuff when they're not home without their permission is just bizarre. That's not a cool thing to do. And so they leave and he tells them, like, seriously, do not come back. 
And later that night, his phone starts blowing up. I don't know if you guys know what Nextdoor is. It's kind of like a forum where everyone can post about the neighborhood. Well, they had posted saying that he was mean and had kicked them out of the pool when they were swimming back there and they should be allowed to use their neighbor's pool. And thankfully, it seemed like most of the other neighborhoods still had brain cells because they were immediately like, wait, did you have permission to use his pool? And they admitted on this post that no, they didn't have permission, but they just assumed because neighbors share everything that they should just be allowed to use it. And after that, every comment was like, A, we don't share everything. There's a reason you're not allowed to borrow my car whenever you want. That's insane. And B, yeah, do you realize how many issues there are with you using his pool without his permission? What if you guys got hurt back there? What if you guys drown? Like, there's so many reasons you don't want people using it. And on top of it, it's just weird to go in someone's backyard when they're not home. Like, why would you even do that, man? Oh, Tim's not home? Oh, sick. I'm gonna go in the backyard and throw the football. His backyard. It's just better than mine. If you really want a pool that bad where you're gonna break into your neighbor's backyard to do it while they're not home, just build your own. I get they're expensive, but clearly it means a lot to you. It needs to be your priority. We can't afford a pool. Yeah, you probably can't afford the lawsuit that's gonna come if you keep breaking into people's backyards either, so you might want to play it safe and just avoid it in the future. I couldn't imagine being that entitled. Just, oh, uh, I want to go swimming, so I'm gonna go break into the neighbor's backyard. It's all right. And listen, before someone comments like, oh, I had a neighbor that was my age and we would be allowed to swim at his pool when they weren't home. It's different if there's been a conversation and like, I don't know, like I had a neighbor who had a bunch of siblings and whatnot and they had a pool and they were like, Ryan, you can just come swimming because one of the kids will probably come swim too. But that had been a conversation. I would have never just walked into their backyard if I didn't know them and start swimming in their pool. I also feel like that's a great way to end up on the opposite end of something being pointed at you that you don't want being pointed at you and someone calling the cops, all right? And being like, stay there until the police get here because you're trespassing in my property. So this last one we've got, this guy just moved into an apartment complex. And whenever you move into an apartment complex, it's always tricky because the person before you probably had internet. And if you're like really into video games and whatnot, the person before you probably didn't have good enough internet. So you need to get it changed. And so this guy switched from the internet that the person had had before that was like not even password protected, barely even worked, basically dial up speed over to something faster and knew that uh, it was smart to have a password on his Wi-Fi network. So we ended up putting a password on. It wasn't even insane. But the old network name was just the unit number. So he ended up keeping that because he just didn't really care. He thought it was easy to explain to guests. Oh yeah, it's da-da-da, like the unit of the apartment. Oh, okay, they would figure that out, be able to hop on, no problem. So he didn't think there was going to be any issue until one night he's sitting on the couch playing Xbox and there's an angry pounding on the door, just doo -doo 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 -doo. And you can just tell from the way that the person's pounding, it's either A, the police here to conduct a raid on your house, or B, it's an angry neighbor. So he goes, looks through the people, and sees it's like a guy around his age that he thought lived above, across from him, kind of like diagonally up. So he opens it, and the guy's like, why did you put a password on your Wi-Fi? And he's confused, and he's like, what do you mean? How do you know I put a password on my Wi-Fi? And he's like, I've been using that Wi-Fi for all of the three years that I've lived here, and you need to let me on it right now. And the guy's confused because two seconds ago he's sitting on his couch playing Xbox and now this guy's telling him that he was basically stealing Wi-Fi from the person who lived there before him. And so he kind of tells the guy like, sorry, I got rid of that and I'm not going to give you the password because I don't know you. I'm not going to let you use my Wi-Fi. And the guy starts trying to argue with him being like, well, if you're going to pay for it anyways, what's the point of hogging it all to yourself? I don't know, man. You're paying rent in this building. Why do you not have the capability to pay for the Wi-Fi? And why would I want you on my Wi-Fi? And so he starts trying to explain to this dude, A, he should probably have his own Wi-Fi, and B, he works from home, does a lot of stuff with work, and can't have people on his network because it's a security issue. And the guy looks at him and says, well, what if I promise that I won't do anything that'll put your security at risk? 
oh yeah, you promised, dude, you pinky promise. He just told you that it's a security issue, and now you look at him and say, I pinky promise I won't do anything. That's like someone telling you, you can't stay here, there's valuable stuff you can't be left alone with, and you look at them and say, I pinky promise I won't steal it. They're just not gonna let you do that. So he tells the guy, like, no, I'm not gonna let you on the network, I'm sorry, maybe somebody else will let you bum Wi-Fi off them, but I'm not gonna let you do that. And he's like, oh, you think I'm bumming Wi-Fi, dude? I was just trying to ask for some help. And he says, yeah, I think you're trying to bum Wi-Fi. That's the definition of what you're doing, dude. You were stealing Wi-Fi from the neighbor near you who didn't have it password protected. And now I changed it and put a password on it, and you're at my door complaining to me about the fact that I put a password on it. What else would you call it? And he's like, wow, man, I just expected people in this complex to be a little bit more generous. People like this guy are the reason people aren't generous anymore, dude, because people just take it for granted and take advantage of it. If you got free Wi-Fi for three years and then someone else moved in and changed it to password protected, you shouldn't even go over and give them crap for that. They didn't know what the prior agreement was. They don't know the person who used to live there. And it's so weird to go over to a stranger and be like, hey, give me your Wi-Fi password so I can do all my stuff that I was doing on the Wi-Fi before. What a weird situation. And then to be mad at them for not wanting to let you on. I pinky promise I won't steal anything. Okay, uh, well, no, still no. And I love that people try to make people feel bad for saying no now, too. Like, if you don't want to let someone on your Wi-Fi network, that's okay. That's a perfectly normal thing. If anyone tries to make you feel bad for that, just know that they are dumb. It's not the other way around. And so he keeps firmly telling the guy, like, no, no, no. And he's not dropping it. He's sitting there being like, I'm not gonna leave until you let me on your Wi-Fi network. And so the guy says, okay, leaves the door open and just stares at him and just stands there. And the guy just keeps being like, I'm serious. I'm not gonna leave until you give me the Wi-Fi password. And the person's just standing in the door saying, okay. And then going right back to staring at him. And he's kind of like, dude, how long are you going to stand here before you give me the password? And he tells him again, I'm not going to give it to you. So we can stand here all day. I can do this all day. I've got nothing going on. I'm not going to give you the password. And he's like, oh, bro, there's no reason to be so stubborn. Yeah, there's also no reason for you to be so stubborn either. You've been waiting an equally long time. This is just a stubborn off at this point, And I understand why the person who sent this to me is not going to back down. I'm not gonna try to go out of my way to start a petty off, but if you make it a petty situation, I will be more petty than you. I feel like you've really got no choice. I I'm sure most of you guys would agree. It's kind of like fighting, you know? Nobody wants to fight, but if someone punches you in the face, you gotta punch them back harder than they hit you. It's just kind of like the rules here. And this is uh, a standoff punch in the face situation. And eventually the neighbor gets so irritated that he's like, you know what, man, forget it. I'll just ask somebody else that's gonna be more kind. And he's like, yeah, go for it, bro. Have a good one. And closed the door and went back to playing his video game. And ever since then, whenever he sees that guy, he like gives him a dirty look and mumbles things under his breath, but he can live with that, man. Sorry. I, I don't know. I know it would probably bug some people if their neighbors didn't like him, but to me, it's just kind of like, eh, whatever. They're just strangers who live next to you. It's not like you have to enjoy each other's company. It's really okay. I'm not going to go out of my way to be disliked by somebody, but if someone disliked me for a reason that stupid, it'd be okay with me. So the person who sent me this story today was working at an ice cream shop downtown in the city he lived in, and you would think that's like a pretty chill job, pretty boring, not a whole lot going on, uh... Such a boring shift, you might start a fight club with your employees and try to knock each other out with waffle cones, whatever floats your boat. But this particular ice cream store was insanely popping. It had been there for a very long time, like 70-something years, so it had kind of become a bit of an institution in the city. And especially on the weekends, it would be like lying out the door for eight hours straight, which sounds super stressful to me. That's not my vibe. Like, if I have to do a job like this, I'm hoping it's as dead as humanly possible. Maybe that's just because I'm lazy. Maybe it's because I just don't like to do work like this. I don't know. 
But the person who sent this to me absolutely loved it because the tips were huge. Because it had been around forever, like a lot of people that had great childhood memories in this ice cream shop had gotten older, gotten a little bit of money, so they'd come in, leave a huge tip. Oh, back in my day, my grandma used to bring me in here, and ice cream was only half a penny. We used to cut pennies in half with shears during the Great Depression. Everybody loved a half a penny. Then you're like, all right, man, here's your vanilla scoop. Get back on the dementia bus, Grandpa. Anyways, uh, the manager who was in charge of, like, the store during the day when people were working was actually the founder's granddaughter. It was a family establishment. It hadn't been bought out by some huge place. Like, it was making a lot of money. It's not like it was some small mom and pop place. But they had kept it in the family, and the manager's mom was the lady who owned the store, but... She didn't really want to be at the ice cream store eight hours a day. She had worked really hard to, like, keep it running. So her daughter was now the manager, and she just kind of hung out, did some other business stuff. And what's mad unfortunate is usually when you try to keep it in the family, the person who founded it works hard. The person who gets it after that works hard. But by the third or fourth generation, the person just doesn't have any idea of work ethic whatsoever. And this manager was no exception. She was a terrible manager. Any chance she would get, she would like throw employees under the bus. If a customer was mad, instead of just making whatever they were mad about right, she would go out of her way to embarrass employees and make them look guilty for whatever the issue was. Like if someone didn't like their flavor of ice cream, she would call out an employee and say, see, I told you that flavor was dumb because each employee got to pick a flavor each month that they wanted to be at the store, which just sucks. As a manager, you got to understand that you're in charge. You can't be going for everyone's throat over small things, especially throwing people under the bus for things as dumb as someone not liking a flavor of ice cream. Yeah, believe it or not, if you have a line out the door eight hours a day on the weekend, at some point, some people are not going to like a few flavors of ice cream. It'd be like if every time someone commented on my video and was like, I don't like this, I just stopped what I was doing and cried for 17 hours. Yeah, okay, people like don't like YouTube videos, it happens, but she would go out of her way to make employees feel bad. And if it got insanely busy, like it was always busy, but if there was a huge rush or whatever, and uh, a lot of people were getting impatient, and there was a lot of people who had paid and were waiting on her ice cream, or their ice cream, instead of like taking the chance to step up and take charge and make everybody get organized, she would literally go hide. Imagine that. It's an insane rush. You don't really know what to do. You're not the manager. It's not like it's your job. You just need a little bit of direction to keep things flowing. You start looking around for your manager and you just see them literally running out the back door to go hide until the rush comes down. And then she would come back after the rush and take all the credit for it. Like, great job, guys. We did an awesome job. Wow, that's a whole lot of we. You're saying a whole lot of we, but when I was uh, watching all the work go down, it was a whole lot of me, you know? But that's the way the nepotism ball bounces sometimes. Every now and then you get really lucky. A company stayed in the family for like 40 generations. Everyone still works hard. But usually it's something like this where the manager got their job because they're the granddaughter of a founder and they don't really know what's going on and they won't get fired because what? They're going to fire their kid? So they just do whatever they want. But that was the experience that they had with this manager. But since the tips were so good, they just dealt with it and kept working because it wasn't like they were going to have another job where they could make more money doing anything easier. But one day, it was just him and the manager working on like a weekday after school, which wasn't insanely busy. There were people coming in and out. But compared to a weekend, it was relatively dead. And he's just doing some work on like a few of the ice cream machines, maintaining them, cleaning them. And he sees this customer come in and just place a little small order. And it was like $4 or something. So he just pulled out a $5 bill and handed it to the manager. The manager said thank you, printed the receipt, and the way that this particular restaurant worked, it had a really old system because it had been around forever and they just hadn't upgraded it, is like if someone paid in cash, you had to take the receipt and put it in with the cash just so they could keep track of it. And his manager looks around and doesn't think he's paying attention, and he sees his manager just pocket the receipt and pocket the cash. And he's kind of shocked because this is just her stealing from the store that her family owns. It's literally like stealing from her mom. And he's even more confused because he's like, wow, she's just straight up uh, hiding the receipt, hiding the cash, the way she did it. It was not the first time she had done it, but he was hoping he just saw something wrong. 
maybe he's just making stuff up. Maybe he doesn't like the manager. He's just imagining things. So he just says like, all right, whatever. I'll keep an eye on it, but I'm not going to confront anyone and say that I saw someone stealing if I'm not 100% sure about it. You don't want to jump to conclusions like run over there and just accuse someone of doing something they didn't do and then they look at you and prove you're crazy and now you lost your job because you accused the owner's daughter of stealing money. So he's paying attention and for the rest of the shift, whenever somebody would pay cash, the manager would take the receipt and the cash and put it into the pocket. And it started getting busier towards the end of the day, but he was paying attention. And he doesn't know an exact amount of the cash that she threw into that pocket, but it was at least over $1,000. As I said, this place gets popping. And a lot of their clientele was older. Older people tend to pay with more cash. And every time somebody was paying with cash, she's just throwing it in her pocket, man. Whatever bank she was going and depositing this in probably thought she was a drug dealer of some sort. Like, dude, this lady comes in with $1,000 in cash every day. Something's off, right? And when we ask her what it's from, she says, don't worry about it. I didn't steal from my mom. Kind of a weird response. Should we look into it? And the guy at the bank's like, nah, don't worry about it. Who cares? Even if they do find out, they'll find us less than we made for it. But yeah, he basically watches the rest of this shift as she's pocketing all the cash. And when there was a huge rush, she went out back. He had to handle it, but he like looked out this back door that he had, or they had, sorry. And he sees her out there counting this cash out of her pocket. So she's not even ashamed enough to like steal it and wait till she gets home to count it out. No, she seriously off rip is out there in the back. Smoking a cigarette while she left the other employee completely alone to handle a rush while counting all the money that she just stole from her mom. That just sounds like a character in a movie that you would make fun of because it's so over the top. You would make fun of the writer like, oh yeah, sure, sure, someone's that evil, they'll steal from their mom and then abandon someone to smoke a cigarette and count the money. Yeah, what's next? They're gonna steal candy from a baby? I, I wouldn't even challenge this lady to steal candy from a baby. She'd probably do it. If you're willing to steal thousands of dollars from your own mom, I'm sure like candy from a baby doesn't even cross your mind. Yeah, no issue. Who cares? If I want it, I'm gonna take it. So he, as she's out and the rush ends, goes over to the cash register just to see what's up and is flabbergasted by how greedy she's been about stealing. You would think that like she maybe just took some money to pay for lunch or whatever. She had taken all of the cash for the day, literally all of it. So whereas like 20% of the business used to be cash transactions, when she's manager at the end of the day when they're reporting it all, there was just magically no cash. And I'm sure in her head, she thought the system was perfect because she was taking that little receipt. So in her mind, she's like, there's no way they'll ever be able to tell that this was even sold. What she didn't think about, though, and I don't think the subscriber even thought about it, is I feel like a lot of places check based on inventory versus profit so they can calculate the margins of like, oh, we sold this much vanilla, we made this much, this is our margin on vanilla, da 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 I don't think they're really like, wow, <laughs> oop, all the ice cream is gone, let's just order more, we're not gonna do the math on how much money we made on this. Eventually, they're gonna figure out that they're selling a lot of ice cream and not making as much money. But she thinks that she's the smartest lady in the world, so I'm sure in her mind this was the perfect system. There was no way anyone would ever find out that she was robbing her own mother. But even if, no one would notice. Like, it can't feel good to go spend money you stole from your mom. I don't know. She probably felt good about it. She was up in Best Buy picking out a new MacBook every day. The guy's like, hey, where's all this money coming from? How about you mind your business and sell me a laptop, all right, buddy? You don't worry about where I'm getting the bands from. And uh, for the next week, he basically just like watches her take things and he's having a huge battle in his head about what to do about it. Because on one hand, he does want to tell his boss, he does want to keep the store like doing well, she is taking a lot of money. On the other hand, do you really want to be the person that gets into a he said, she said with the owner's daughter? The founder's granddaughter? Like, do you want to be in a situation where it's your word versus hers? Probably not. Because it's not like she's going to come out and say, yes, you're right, I have been stealing tons of money from my mom. If she's already stealing money from her mom, she's probably super cool with lying to cover it up. But he doesn't really have to worry about it because the owner, the mom, sends out a text to all the employees saying that they are going to have a serious meeting that Thursday. And he was at work when they got the text, and as soon as the manager reads it, she starts freaking out. 
going around asking everybody all frantically, oh, what do you think it's about? What do you think this could possibly be about? Oh, wh why do you think we're having a meeting? Do any of you guys have any idea what it could be about? Because I have no clue. I have no idea why we could be having a meeting. Just being super nervous, which made it obvious to him because he knew what was going on, why she was nervous. If someone's calling a serious meeting and all staff has to be there and they don't usually call serious meetings, I wonder if it has anything to do with the massive amounts of money that's been going missing. It's kind of making everybody a little bit, like, confused on why she's so nervous, because literally no one else was. Because no one else was taking money or anything. Everyone else was just thinking maybe they were going to be opening another location, maybe they were going to be redecorating or something. No one else's mind was on, like, them being in trouble, them being fired, anyone taking anything, because it's just not something anyone else had noticed. It was just that this guy happened to see it one time, so he started paying attention. It's not like usually he was paying any attention. He was just doing his thing, like working on the ice cream machine, getting ice cream. He wasn't usually like 2020 eagle eyed vision watching what everyone does with every transaction all the time. But she's freaking out, continuously asking everyone if they should just ditch, like, oh, we just don't have to go. And everyone keeps telling her, like, no, it's okay. Like, it's just a meeting. It's not that big of a deal. But how nervous she is, you would have thought it was a team skydiving trip. Everybody at the ice cream store was going to have to jump out of a plane with a parachute and through the power of teamwork slow themselves down enough. That's not what's going on. It should just be a meeting unless you have something to be mad nervous about. But whatever, the day of the meeting comes, everybody comes in and is sitting there, and the manager is literally sitting in the front row, like, it's so nervous she's shaking, biting her fingernails. And the owner comes in, her mom, walks to the front and says, Listen guys, I really hate that we have to be having this meeting. If I had it my way, this would never have to be an issue. I'm very, very disappointed that it has to come to this. I don't know who it is, but I know that someone is stealing... And before she even launches into, like, what's been stolen, uh, how they know it's been being stolen, like, it's obvious she's about to keep talking. She wasn't done with what she was saying. Her daughter stands up, the only person to stand up, and very loudly is like, What? Someone is stealing? No way. Who would dare to steal from you, Mom? Are you kidding me? This store that my grandpa opened, someone is stealing from it? I can't believe this. Who would do this? And the mom literally stops her and says, can you sit down? I'm not done yet. But everyone is kind of like slowly having their eyebrows raised because she keeps way overreacting. No one else jumped up and started screaming. You're the only one doing that. At least let the explanation finish, you know? Someone's stealing. For all you know, your mom was about to say, someone is stealing spatulas. Like, you didn't even let them finish the sentence and you're already acting like you had nothing to do with it. So the mom goes on to explain that they had been ordering a certain amount of ice cream and making a certain amount of money for a long time. That had magically stopped, so they started looking into it, and they thought it was odd that the cash was just always gone recently. Huh, yeah, that would probably raise some red flags. You've been making a certain amount on the ice cream that you order. All of a sudden, that stops. You start looking into it. And all of the cash is missing for, like, weeks on end? Huh, I wonder what happened. Do you think everyone on the planet just magically stopped using cash, or do you think someone's taking it? Unless you're dumber than Patrick Starr himself, you can probably surmise that someone's taking it. Especially because this place was older and cash was always, like, a solid chunk of their business. It's not like it was steadily going down for a while and then stopped. It went from like $20,000, $30,000 a month in cash to none very, very quickly, like an insane drop off. So someone has very evidently been stealing cash, but the mom doesn't really know who it is. She didn't have any camera set up to watch like the, the backside of the registers, which is dumb. They probably should have had that, but she explains that she's going to have to put cameras back there just to watch what happened, and she felt bad about doing it. She didn't want anyone to think she was invading their privacy, but she had to figure it out, which is a super nice owner thing to even be worried about. Like, if I owned a store, yeah, I'm 100% putting cameras behind the registers. Not because I wouldn't trust my employees, but, like, if someone's going to rob you, they're going to walk up to the register. That's probably just where you want a camera. But I don't think you owe anyone an apology if people are taking money and you're like, I have to figure out who's stealing money from me. 
But she goes on to explain that it's a very big deal and she has to do this because whoever's been taking money had stolen a little bit over $52,000 from the store at this point. That's a hefty chunk of change, ladies and gentlemen. That's not like a, a little $5 cone of ice cream that you take on your way out on a Friday. That would still be wrong, but you know, it's harmless. $52,000 is a lot of money, but it's especially a lot of money to steal from your mom, bro. Do you want her to retire? Do you want her to be able to like, I, I don't know, go on vacation in her old age? Really out here taking like a full year salary of the average person from your mom in the span of like a year because you just want it? I'm shocked they didn't figure it out sooner. It, really, it seems like their accountant was lagging behind if it took until $52,000 for anyone to notice. But whatever, the manager still doesn't come clean. She doesn't take this moment to be like, wow, I didn't realize how much money I've taken. It's gotten really out of control. They just keep their mouth shut. And the subscriber keeps expecting them to come forward, which was probably dumb on their part. It's not like they were going to come forward. Whatever though, over the next few days the cameras are getting set up and none of the employees are really that mad about it because how could you really be mad about it? It's a really understandable situation and even if you are really mad about it, like go ahead and freak out, they're probably gonna put the cameras in anyways. But the manager actually is who starts getting really really weird about the cameras, isn't that bizarre? She starts trying to like rile up all the workers to get mad about the cameras but it's not working. She gathers them all up and is like, you guys think that this is okay that they're going to invade our privacy like this? And everyone says, well, the other parts of the store are on camera. So, I mean, it's just like one more part. And it makes sense. Someone's taking money. And then someone said, yeah, and I feel safer if they're on camera anyways. And she's just going off about how she can't believe that they would be so okay with being on camera all the time. And I just feel like living in the 21st century, outside of your house, just assume there's a security camera somewhere recording a part of what's going on, like whether it's it's your car, whether it's your elbow, like there's just so many cameras, so many places these days, chances are you're going to be under surveillance. And on top of it, if the rest of the restaurant and rest of the store is under surveillance, I don't know, having a camera on the register doesn't seem that weird, but she can't get everyone all riled up to hate the idea of the cameras. And you would think once the cameras get installed, she can't get everybody to get on board with hating the cameras for no reason, that she would stop stealing, because you're going to get caught now. It's literally inevitable. If you're on camera behind the register, you can't take money from the register. At least that's what most people with like a smart thought process would think. I guess most people with a smart thought process just wouldn't be stealing in the first place. But whatever, she did not have the ability to stop for some reason and decided to throw it all away to just keep taking this cash. And I get that it's a lot of money, but eventually she probably would have just inherited the business anyways. But no, instead, she just kept stealing, and duh, the cameras recorded what the cameras recorded. And one day, her mom comes in and confronts her. In the middle of, like, a, a slower day, there were still some customers in the store. She comes in and starts yelling her daughter's name, which I'm not gonna say, and starts saying how could she steal from her, and, like, didn't she know that she was going to get caught? The cameras were there, she couldn't believe her own daughter would steal from her. And instead of being ashamed and embarrassed and apologizing or like showing any regret whatsoever, she just goes off about how she doesn't get paid enough so she had to take matters into her own hands. Alright, if you don't like how much your mom's paying you, go have a conversation about it. Don't start stealing. And you definitely don't need to steal $52,000. That seems a little bit excessive. Oh, I'm just trying to make ends meet by stealing 52 grand. What ends are you trying to meet, dude? A car payment? Like, nine car payments? I, I just don't understand. So the mom starts getting mad and is like, you're not even going to be apologetic about it. I can't believe I raised a daughter that would be so ungrateful. You're fired. Duh, you have to fire someone if they're stealing from you. You can't keep someone on board if you can't even trust that, like, all the money that you make that day is going to go to your pocket. But she starts arguing with her mom about being fired and says that her mom can't fire her because she's her daughter. Last time I checked, that's not an official rule. Uh, you can definitely fire someone if they're related to you, it doesn't matter. And you could 100% fire someone for stealing from you if they're related to you. 
theoretically, she could have had you, like, arrested. If she really wanted to, she could have called the cops, they would have come and arrested you and put you in jail. The fact all she was going to do is come scream at you in front of some customers and fire you, you should count your lucky stars and leave. But of course, once her daughter starts being like, you can't fire me, I'm your daughter, she goes off about how, if you're my daughter, why would you steal from me in the first place? And she's still refusing to leave, saying that this job is all she has and she can't fire her. And at that point, her mom's getting pissed because it's just causing a scene in the restaurant. So she threatens to call the cops. And she's like, you can't call the cops, I'm your daughter. I don't know why she thinks that just uh, like makes everything null and void. All right, guys, if your dad steals a bunch of money from you, you're just out of luck. You gotta let him take it. But finally, once she threatens to call the cops, she starts running, like trying to take off to get out of there so she won't get in trouble. And the doors were push doors, right? So it should have been very easy for her to run out. But she runs up to the push door, goes to pull it, and then keeps running. So she might be the only person in the world who has ever managed to clothesline themselves by trying to run out of a push door. So she just smacks into the door, Something out of like an animated movie where they hit the glass and kind of down the side, but she pops back up and is like, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, and opens the door and sprints out. And the mom starts looking around at all the workers who are standing there slack-jawed watching at like this Mori episode going down while they're trying to have a normal day of work and says that like she's sorry and she's gonna give them a uh, little bit of a bonus for having to watch that. And they're like, no, we're sorry, can we help with anything? She says no, but she's going to have to look for a new manager, and like, she's really sorry about having to put the cameras in just to find out it was her daughter, she never expected it, and everyone is being nice to her, like, yeah, we understand you never expected your daughter to be stealing money from you. So, anyways, she goes to the customer, she kind of makes it right with them, I'm sorry you had to see that, and some of the customers are pretending like they didn't find it entertaining, alright, like, that was insane, come on. I'm not saying it was nice, I wish it would have never happened, but if I walked into an ice cream store and witnessed that go down, I would be like, I will come here every day. If you promise me something that nuts happens, it would make my job so much easier, you know? Like, I just go to this one place and every time I go there, someone just gets caught stealing and gets ran out of the store. I wouldn't be good for business, you know, but it would be entertaining for the videos, that's for sure. So whatever, after a couple more weeks of deliberation, the guy who sent this to me actually got promoted, so in a weird way, it was kind of good for him. Not good for anyone else, like destroying a family's never good. But if you decide to steal from your mom, don't stop stealing when she puts in cameras. Steal $52,000 from your mom and then get mad when she catches you. Don't apologize, say whatever, I'm your daughter, you can't do anything about it. It's kind of on you, like it, it's 100% on you. I just wish she would have never done it. Alright, so this story time starts with a subscriber that was about 9 years old when all of this went down. They're no longer 9, but that's about the age where, you know, you might still have some trouble really deciphering what's like a movie and what you should actually do in real life. And this was around Christmas time, and because of that, they had just watched Home Alone. And for those of you that have never seen Home Alone, first of all, you should, dude. It's a classic, and if you haven't, then you're really missing out. But, you know, for those of you that haven't, basically it's about this kid whose house is going to get broke into, so he sets up booby traps everywhere. And on this particular night, the subscriber had a babysitter, and they were kind of hanging out. And obviously, one thing leads to another, and this person starts telling their babysitter about how they're afraid the house is going to get broken into, and they're going to set up booby traps, and blah, 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 blah. And the babysitter does the right thing in that moment and is like, hey, we're not going to do that. No one's going to break into your house. Everything's going to be okay. But then the babysitter got a call. Um, this was before, like, you know, cell phones were super smart, so it's a flip phone. She answers it, basically finds out that, you know, something's gone on at home and she needs to get home immediately. And when you're babysitting a nine-year-old, usually the best option in that situation isn't to just leave them alone in the house. But I guess she knew that his parents were going to be home in an hour, everything was safe, the house wasn't going to get broken into, so she says that she's going to leave him there, tell his parents that, you know, she's really sorry, but she's got to scram. And like I said, probably not the best babysitter move of all time, okay? I feel like leaving a nine-year-old unsupervised is, is, is not the smartest decision decision, especially when they just told you that they're horrified the house is going to get broken into. You know, I don't know what the emergency was, but if somebody's like, hey dad, I'm really, really afraid of monsters in the closet, and you go, eh, deal with it, leave the closet door open and say LMAO, and then say, by the way, I'm leaving, the monster's going to eat you, it might just make them a little bit more afraid. So <laughs> when the babysitter leaves, the subscriber starts to instantly get like paranoia cranked to 11. Every little noise, every little thing just starts to remind this guy of home alone and like the 
fact that somebody's going to break in. And I want to make it very clear that, like, they lived in a safe neighborhood. There was no one that was actually going to break in. But when you're nine and you're afraid of something, sometimes your fear starts to get the best of you. And so this kid decides at that point that if he's going to be home alone and he's going to hear all these things and think people are going to break in, then he's going to booby trap his house so that way... If anyone breaks in, they won't be able to get them, just like Home Alone, you know, because movies are real life and you should do everything that you see in there. So this kid starts running around the house, just grabbing everything he can, you know, Hot Wheels cars, he goes up to the garage, grabs some power tools, and he just starts building traps around the house. They had this little mat right inside, like, the door, and he put Hot Wheels cars underneath it so that way it would slide, dude. He had, like taken his mom's, you know, um, nail polish and, like, just put it all over the doorknob so that way it would put paint on their hands. In his mind, he says that he thought it would make it easier to identify their fingerprints. He had a BB gun, and so obviously, you know, the guy in Home Alone, Kevin, also has a BB gun, so he's, like, ready to take some shots at anyone who breaks in. He doesn't go ahead and, like, put nails in any of the stairs or anything. There's no paint cans ready to knock anybody out, but, you know, he makes a few more, like, little traps. Make sure all the doors are locked, you know, and uh, the only other thing he does that was way too extreme is there was a basement door that you could come in that, like, came in through the basement. And for some reason, the lock on it was kind of janky, and this kid was super paranoid that that's where the robbers were going to break in. Like, the janky lock was going to attract them, they were just going to bust in. So this kid had gone to the garage, gotten a 2x4 and, like, a nail gun. How he knew how to use a nail gun, who knows, and, like, put the 2x4 on the garage door so it could no longer open, or the basement door, sorry. I'm, I'm not from a place that has basements, so that's weird to me. But, you know, obviously, in all of this, going way overboard, it takes a little bit of time, and he suddenly realizes that his parents should be home in about 15 minutes. Now, obviously, sometimes when your parents say, like, they're gonna be home at about 10, that doesn't necessarily mean that, like, they might not be home early, they might not be home later. About 10 means 15 minutes early, 15 minutes late, maybe right on the dot. But regardless, in his mind, when his parents said they'd be home at about 10, he didn't think they'd be pulling up any earlier than 10. So as he's kind of realizing he set up all these traps and he's got 15 minutes till his parents get home, he sees lights come into the driveway. And obviously, because he's horrified, people are going to break in. He doesn't, like, run to the window and see what the car is. He, by default, just assumes that it's people breaking into the house. And as I said, this is not the smartest way to go about it, but it's like a little kid. It's a nine-year-old home alone who thinks people are breaking in. The logic is never going to be on a thousand in this situation. So he grabs his BB gun, goes to the top of the stairs so he can see the front door, and starts to, like, get ready, you know? And he, like, hears footsteps walking up to the door, and he hears noises on the other side, and he hears a voice that he doesn't recognize being like, what's all over the door handle? And then he hears a woman that kind of sounds like his mom, but not enough that he knows it's his mom for sure. It is through the door, and he's up the stairs. It's, like, a little bit muffled. Saying, like, I don't know, I don't know, you know, and so they uh, aren't going to use this door, so they start going around to the other door. And so he gets his little BB gun, and he, like, runs over to get a vision of that door. And they get over there, and once again through the door, he's like, what is on the door handle? And finally, they're like, whatever, we'll just open it. So they start trying to open the door. But keep in mind, this is the door that he's put that 2x4 on. So, like, they start trying to unlock the door and get in, and so the lock turns. He assumes that a robber is picking the lock, and then, like, the door doesn't open. And so he starts to hear another guy's voice, and he doesn't really recognize it. It sounds vaguely like his dad, but in his mind now, he's horrified. Like, obviously, at that point, you probably realize, oh, that's my parents. But in his mind, he's now convinced people are breaking in, so it's not like logical thinking is on the top of his uh, brain. So he just starts to assume that they're trying to break into the house and so there's two man voices talking about how they can't get the door open and then they decide to start slamming into it as i said this door's a little bit janky so i'm sure his parents on the other side are like oh whatever if we just kind of slam into it a bit with the door handle turn it'll pop open so they start slamming into it the two by four is not budging and they're kind of like wow that's weird that this door is locked let's go back around to the front door so they start going around to the front door and at this point he is really convinced that these are robbers breaking in Obviously, you know, common sense says no, but if someone starts, like, slamming on the door trying to get in and you have been watching nothing but Home Alone where you're now convinced that everything's a threat, I could see why that would scare you. And so they go back around to the front door, they unlock it, and they open it. And when they open it, I don't know if it was just because they had been, like, slamming their shoulders into the downstairs door in the basement and couldn't get it open, but they, like, push in really fast. 
and he sees his dad's friend come in first flying through the door and when he steps on the mat his front leg shoots out because he had put some hot wheel cars underneath it and he does like a splits formation and it's something out of a movie because this guy drops into the splits formation and just does like the wide face of just pain you know as you can assume someone doing the splits that doesn't usually do the splits would feel if that just suddenly is what was dropped on him and so obviously he like drops into the splits and in that moment he's afraid but then he remembers in home alone that like just because you know and recognize them doesn't mean they're not breaking into your house because like the wet bandits had been to his house before or whatever so he decides that he's gonna shoot him with the bb gun anyways dude so he loads up and he shoots him with the bb gun and it like hits him in the arm and he's wearing a leather jacket but he's like ow because he feels it and so at that point obviously people are like what's going on and all that he says to this dude's parents are he shot me with a bb gun and at that moment his mom like bursts into the door yelling but when she came in and started yelling he still didn't recognize her because her face was like covered by her coat right because i i don't know if she was afraid that the bb gun was coming for her next or whatever but she just kind of ran in and at that point he's like they've breached the walls of my facility my booby traps have not worked and so he bolts upstairs even further like the rest of the way up and sprints to his room and locks the door and starts like putting chairs furniture everything he can up against the door and then at that point they're knocking on the door like it's your parents it's your parents calm down and he recognizes his parents voice but now he thinks that the robber is holding his parents hostage to try to get him to come out and he's like i'm not coming out i'm not coming out i'm not coming out there's more booby traps in the house so don't go rob anything i'm not coming out all right guys i'm gonna interrupt the video for just one second if you take a look at your screen now you'll see a gift card code for those of you that don't know i give one of these away and every single video i post here on the channel is a way to say thank you to y'all for subscribing and turning on notifications so you should do that if you haven't already and thank you if you have and while i've interrupted the video you might as well press the like button comment down below it helps the video do better and on that note i'll shut up peace and so at that point like everybody in the house so it's his dad his mom and his dad's friend who has now done the splits and gotten blat by a bb gun right and they're like dude there's nobody else here come out but they're also too afraid to go anywhere else in the house because he said that he's booby trapped at all so for an hour they're out there just trying to convince him to come out you know and it gets so bad that like the guy that was coming back to hang out with his parents you know he ends up just leaving he's like look i appreciate it it's getting late now i'm not exactly like feeling comfortable considering i know this house is booby trapped but your kid won't come out and tell us where any of the traps are so i'm gonna dip so he leaves and now it's just his parents trying to convince him to come out being like there's no robbers here and finally like i said after an hour he comes out and he's like listen guys you gotta understand that you know there's a way you're supposed to come into the house he starts trying to lecture his parents and they're not having any of it they're like first of all why are you alone and he explains the situation with the babysitter and now they're more mad at the babysitter than anything like obviously you're not too happy with your kid booby trapping everything and like using his bb gun to defend the house but at the same time you can't be mad at him either because what do you want him to do if he's a little kid who's home alone wouldn't you rather him like be aware of the house and protect it than like not be aware of the fact that someone could break in and just be answering the door for strangers like hey my mom's not home but come in L let's be honest i feel like you can't get too mad at your kid for being afraid of being robbed that's just a pretty normal fear so they're kind of like well i guess that kind of makes sense but why did you booby trap everything like what did you think that was gonna do and he starts to say it was just to buy him time you know the only thing he didn't get time to set up was a super good escape route so he was just gonna like come into his room and call police but when he got in here he realized he didn't have a phone so obviously he had you know made a trap big enough to like block them from the basement door he made a dude slide on hot wheels but didn't think through the whole calling the police thing once he got to his final location because you know just inspired by the fun parts of home alone and when they asked him where he had like thought of booby trapping and whatnot he was honest with them and said that he had thought of it after watching the movie right and so from then until like he was an older kid like you know 15 years old they just weren't allowed to watch home alone because they were like the last thing we need is you to get more ideas and booby trap the house more often which listen to me is a little bit disappointing because that's a christmas classic dude as far as christmas movies go that and die hard are definitely up there I just also don't understand, like, I, I, I'm just gonna be honest, when I was a little kid, dude, when my parents would leave me home alone, I would do the same stuff, except I would, like, have a Nerf gun, and in my mind, I'd be like, this will help me catch robbers. I don't understand in my mind what I thought the robber was gonna do when he walked in and sees, like, a recon CS6 Nerf gun, and is like, oh, what is that gonna do, prevent me from punching you in the face? 
Either way, though, that's just the way the ball bounces. You definitely got to check on your babysitters because, like, whoever just decided to leave a nine-year-old completely unattended should not be hired as a babysitter anymore. All in all, though, very great story, and I feel like the first time you watch Home Alone after not being able to watch it for a long time after you booby-trapped your house, like, it has to have felt great. It has to have been some of the best freedom you've ever felt. Watching Macaulay Culkin drop a can of paint and knock out a robber is definitely a satisfying way to kick off the holidays, and it's November now, so technically you're allowed to. I will say, parents, though, I don't know if I'd want my kid to see the sequel to Home Alone if he's already Home Alone the entire house once. Like, he's like, oh, okay, next time we go to the airport, my goal is to get lost in New York, because then you get to do it all over again. Regardless, um, you know, if anyone else has had any experiences trying to replicate a Christmas movie, if you've ever tried to turn your nose into a red flashlight so you can be Rudolph or pretend that you were born in the North Pole to be like Buddy from Elf, be sure to send me your story. I'd love to make fun of you about it. Today I've got a story time for y'all about arguably one of the stupidest things I've ever seen a spoiled kid do. Which is really saying something, you know? Usually the spoiled kid gets mad about being banned from video games or something, but like, this dude just really decided to destroy his parents' windshield for no reason. But before we get into it, be sure to press the like button, otherwise, no joke, no scam whatsoever. You will be cursed by a very angry witch, and you don't want that to happen, so press the like button, and without further ado, let's hop into it. So one day I was out in front of my house just like playing three flags up with some of the other kids in the neighborhood and we decided that we were going to take a break so everybody just started kind of like talking about whatever. Most people were probably talking about the NFL season that far that year but two kids started getting into like a one-up battle which is one of the most annoying battles to listen to. Nuh-uh, whatever you did was lame, whatever I did was way cooler. But instead of just, like, having a one-up battle, they were one-upping each other about who respected their parents less, which is a really weird argument to have. And so, eventually, everybody else stopped paying attention to what they were talking about and just started paying attention to the two guys that were arguing about who respected their parents less than the other. And I'm really not sure why, but they were just roasting their parents, right? They were like, dude, I respect my parents so little that I purposely leave my dirty dishes on the table to make them clean it up. Like, they were just going in, and obviously because everybody was listening and it's not something you expect people to be saying, we were all laughing at it. We thought they were joking more than anything. And then after that guy said that, the other guy replied and said that, like, he could break stuff and his parents wouldn't even care. Which just can't be true. I mean, even if you're, like, the most chill person on the planet, you'd probably be pissed off if someone came into your house and started breaking things on purpose, and doubly so if they were like, yeah, I'm gonna break this stuff because you don't care if I break this stuff. But whatever, they're going back and forth, and after he talks about how he could break stuff and nobody would care, everybody kind of goes silent because we don't want to get in trouble. No one wants to be the guy to call out his bluff and then him go break something and then it come back on them. Like, oh, why did you tell my kid to break something? So whatever, the guy he's in the argument with decides to call his bluff and call him out, but nobody else is laughing anymore. Nobody else is having a good time. And he says, I guarantee you that you won't break your parents' windshield right now. Which is obviously just something he thought of because he was like, the kid won't do it. No way anyone would be stupid enough to do that. Sure enough, no one would be dumb enough. And whatever, the kid's response is like, I guarantee you I'd do it right now. I'm not afraid of anything. And he's like, all right, if you're really confident that you can break everything and get away from it, then uh, go ahead and go break your parents' windshield. And some of us in the crowd literally start trying to reason with the guy, and we're like, don't do that, man. That's a very stupid idea. I guarantee you it's not worth it. Like, you're going to get in trouble if you break your parents' windshield. And instead of heeding the warning whatsoever of a lot of us, he's just like, whatever, my parents aren't going to care. It's not going to be a big deal. Windshields aren't cheap, and even if they were, that's just so inconvenient, dude. Imagine you have to go to work in the morning, you go to get in your car, and you just see, like, a huge crack in your windshield because your kid decided to take a dare from somebody over who respects their parents less. Oh, I failed as a parent when my kid starts destroying my car and preventing me from earning a living to teach me a lesson. But whatever, Mr. Entitled decides to go through with it, so he says, Fine, what? I, I don't care, I'll break whatever I want. So he goes over to, like, the landscaping nearby, and I grew up in Las Vegas where grass is practically illegal at this point. You're not allowed to really use water for anything. 
So he goes, it's not hard to find like a decent sized rock. A lot of people have these like fake rivers. I don't know how to explain it, right? It's like almost like a stream. They leave like a riverbed of rocks. If you grow up in a desert place, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If not, it, it doesn't really matter. He picks up a decent sized rock and he starts walking over to his mom's car. And a couple of us warn him again, like, dude, this is a bad idea. Don't do it. And he walks over in front of his mom's car and starts holding this rock above his head. Almost like he's Atlas from the ancient Greek myth, you know, with the world on his shoulders. He's just got this rock above him looking at the windshield like it's the most threatening thing he's ever seen. Like he just has to take it out. And him and the guy start arguing back and forth about how like, dude, clearly you're scared of doing it. Don't break your parents' windshield if you're afraid of them. Like, it's not worth it. It's okay. The guy who's arguing with him is saying this to him. And he's like, no, man, I respect my parents less than you respect your parents. Like, he was so bent on winning this argument that he really didn't care. And they're going back and forth. And finally, almost to like prove a point, he decides to just throw the rock at his mom's windshield. So he takes this decent sized rock and he gets some force behind it, you know, like an overhead throw. And it smacks into the windshield. And I can remember the sound. It just like sounded like, Kick! and then you could almost hear the glass splintering outwards. We probably literally couldn't hear it, but watching it, you're like, oh, that was not good. So the rock gets stuck like halfway through the windshield. It didn't have enough force to go all the way through. So this rock is sticking halfway out of the windshield like an asteroid sticking out of the ground. And there's all these spider webs off of it. And it's not even like you could drive it to a shop and get it fixed. Where it was sitting and how bad the spider web was, like, there's no way that you're going to be able to drive this car until it gets a new windshield. And so we all decide to book it, because we don't want to get in trouble for this. We had nothing to do with it. So me and all my friends that weren't involved in the argument, we go home. Because I'm not trying to get in trouble for something I didn't do. And it just so happened that the kid that threw this rock was the type of person who loved to blame things on other people, you know? Like, if anyone would have been hanging around there when his parents came outside, he would have 100% tried to blame it on them. So I go to my house and I start playing PlayStation, and it just so happened that my room's window overlooks that kid's house where the broken windshield was. So I didn't really tell my parents what was going on, I just go up and start playing video games, and it was a beautiful day, so eventually my mom comes into my room and opened the window and she's like yeah I'm gonna open up all the windows because it's a great day and I only remember that because it's what made the next part so easy to hear but I hear another car pull up and as soon as the door opens there's immediate screaming of like what happened to my car what happened to my car and I'm like oh his parents are home you know and they start yelling even more about how someone must have attacked the car, like they should have called the cops. Clearly someone's vandalizing them, trying to destroy their car. And I don't hear what somebody says back because they don't yell it, but I hear his parents yell, what do you mean that you did this? Why would you break our windshield? Why do you think that's a good idea? And like I said, I didn't hear exactly what was said from the kid to the parents. I just heard their yelling response. But imagine you've been grocery shopping, you know, you come back, you got to unload some ice cream into the freezer. There's just a rock sticking halfway out of your windshield. Your car would literally be impossible to drive safely. You start freaking out, you know, no one would be dumb enough to do that to their own car. So like one of the neighborhood kids must have decided to commit some vandalism, must have decided that th they were gonna take revenge on you. And then your kid comes outside and is like, oh yeah, my bad, I was in a competition of who disrespected their parents more and I decided to win. So, whatever, I, I don't know what story he said, but there was like a good 20 minutes of screaming about how they could not believe that he would be dumb enough to break the windshield and he was gonna have to pay for it and he inconvenienced them so much because how are they supposed to get to work now? And he wasn't yelling back, so I wouldn't really hear what he said, but his parents were not getting any calmer. So I got a good feeling that it wasn't like super apologetic and, oh, I'm so sorry for breaking the windshield. I know for a fact that if I would have done this to my parents, then I would have been grounded for a good century and a half. I, I would have had to become a vampire and be immortal to ever see the outside of my room again. I just feel like, I don't know, if I broke my parents' windshield and then they found out about it and I was like, eh, whatever, I don't care, there would have not been very fun consequences. And I did not see the dude outside for like a week. 
other than school. He would go to school, but he was definitely in some pretty big grounding, and he was also going to, like, other neighborhoods and mowing lawns to try to get money to pay him back. And I know windshields aren't cheap either, so I don't know how many lawns you have to mow to pay for a windshield replacement, but I feel like that was a lot of labor. Hopefully he learned his lesson, though. I, I didn't really spend a lot of time hanging out with him after, so who knows if that's still his party trick. Whenever he gets a little uh, too drinky, he just goes and starts throwing rocks through windshields. But just don't break your family's stuff. It it's really easy not to. All right, so this job takes place when I worked at the movie theater. It's not the longest one in the world. It was just really bizarre. Basically, at this movie theater, we had a really fast turnover rate. There was, like, always new people. There was always people leaving. There was a lot of people that worked there, and it's not like it was a glamorous job that a lot of people wanted to stay at for the rest of their lives, you know? But whatever, this kid showed up, and he had a different polo shirt on than the rest of us. We got, like, given one from work with our logo, but it was the same color, so none of us cared. We just start working, but we had one manager who was super nitpicky about that stuff, and it was kind of annoying, but obviously when he realized the guy was wearing a different shirt, he started asking him, well, why don't you have a company shirt? Like, we gave you one at the end of your interview, where is it? And instead of going, oh, I forgot it and I had this one that was the same color, or like any excuse, the kid's response is to just angrily yell at the manager and be like, I can't wear that cheap crap. And yeah, the shirt was cheap, it was itchy, but all of us are standing there like, dude, the shirt sucks, but it's our job, it's kind of our uniform, no one likes to wear what they have to wear to work. And our manager is confused and is like, what do you mean it's a crappy shirt? And he grabs his polo, you know when people grab their clothes and like pull on it to show it off? He does that and he says, this polo was $3,000, okay bro? I don't want to wear your cheap knockoff. I don't think the company was sitting there trying to knock off your $3,000 polo. I don't think they knew that a $3,000 shirt existed, if you want me to be honest. It was like he couldn't understand that places can have you wear a polo shirt for a uniform and they're not trying to copy a design. Like, it's not a fashion statement. It just happens to be something that people can wear that's like a little bit nicer than a t-shirt, but comfortable and they're cheap to order in bulk quantities. And my manager doesn't really know how to explain the idea of a work uniform to this guy. So he just says, well, you have to wear your uniform or you can't work here. Like, it's corporate policy. If I let you wear a different shirt, then I have to let everybody wear a different shirt. And, like, I just can't do that. And he kind of tries to threaten my boss, you know. Well, I'll quit right now on the spot if you're going to make me wear the company shirt. Which really only works if you have a ton of leverage at your company, you know? Like, if you're just somebody that's absolutely irreplaceable, you're the only guy that knows the software they use, you can say, you're gonna do this or I'm gonna leave. But this guy had only been here for 20 minutes, so it's not like he's some expert that we can't work without. And no offense, but it was very easy to find people that could come in and work at the movie theater. I worked there for a year, I liked the job, but it was not backbreaking work. It's not like it was very difficult to get the hang of. You press play on the movie and you sweep popcorn. It's not like you're the CEO that's grown the company from nothing to like a billion dollars in revenue and if they don't give you a chunk then you're walking. Like you just have no leverage. It was literally just the equivalent of like, I, I don't know, a slightly more glamorous janitor position where you also got to press play on the movie. And every now and then you, you serve people popcorn and they got mad at you because movie theater prices are expensive. But whatever, he tries to threaten my boss and is like, you're gonna let me wear this polo shirt or I'm gonna quit. And my boss just wasn't having it and says, okay, fine, I, I guess you don't work here. And the guy is stupefied for a second looking at my boss, but then storms out all angrily talking about how we wasted his time. And all of us were confused because we didn't understand how we wasted his time. And on top of that, he put in a lot more work to get the job than he did at the job. Think about it, between the job interview, having to come back and like sign all the paperwork, get your shirt, all that stuff, like, you know, getting a job takes some time, a couple days to just get everything all sorted. He probably spent more time getting the job and signing up for the job than he ever did getting paid for the job. So, I, I don't know what he was really thinking, that just seems like a bad investment. On the bright side, he can always go sell his polo shirt. Like, <laughs> I guess for $3,000? How do you even spend three grand on a polo shirt? 
obviously, you know, designer clothes are designer clothes, but I feel like even a nice polo shirt, like if somebody was like, this polo shirt was 200 bucks, I'd be like, that's a really nice shirt. I I'm not really understanding how you spend three grand on a shirt and it's worth it. I feel like you hit the point of diminishing returns on t-shirt quality. Either way, dude quit his job because he refused to wear a uniform, so some people out there are just so spoiled the idea of a uniform breaks their brain. All right, so this next one, I was at a restaurant like two months ago, and I'll be honest, it was very uneventful. Our waiter was just a chill dude that was getting us food very, like, I, I don't know. It wasn't like the greatest restaurant experience I ever had, but there was nothing to complain about. It was literally fine. Our waiter was fine, and it would have just been an uneventful day if it wasn't for the dude that like just decided to come in like a wrecking ball a la Miley Cyrus. If anything, our waiter was a little too soft-spoken, like he was a little too quiet, but that'll matter in a little bit. Whatever, though, me and my friends are, like, at dinner chilling, and this guy comes in with this date, and they sit behind me and my friends, and he instantly starts talking about, like, how rich his parents are and how they own so much around town, so basically everywhere he goes, he's a big deal, so he, he wouldn't be surprised if their meal was taken care of tonight. And the girl, like, doesn't even have time to respond to what he's saying because he's just talking so much about how much money his parents have, and it's really awkward. And me and my friends weren't even trying to listen in and eavesdrop, but he's basically yelling it, and they're right behind us, so there's just not much we could do. And his date's just not really being impressed by it. She's not replying. He's not giving her a lot of time to reply. And it was almost like he didn't understand why someone wouldn't be super impressed by the fact that he had rich parents. And so when that didn't work, he decided to shift and just start complaining about the service because, I don't know, maybe in his brain that was a relatable conversation starter. But they had just sat down like a minute ago, so they hadn't even talked to anyone other than the person that sat them yet. So as he's complaining about how, like, man, the service here sucks, no one's even come to talk to us yet, even though they've been there for 40 seconds, the waiter, who's the same waiter as us, they had sat him in their section, right, or sat them in his section, walks up and he says, hey guys, what can I get you to drink? Which is the most normal sentence a waiter would say to you. I feel like nine times out of ten, it's something along those lines is the first sentence. But Mr. Richie Rich goes, what did you just say to me? And the waiter pauses and is like, what can I get you to drink? And you think that's appropriate. And the waiter is looking at this guy like, is that appropriate? What, how else could I say it? So he just says, yeah, I think. And I don't know, in Richie Rich's mind, he probably thought that if he started yelling at this service worker that his date would think it was really cool. But now we've turned, like I've turned, they, my friends could see it. I've turned because I'm just hearing this guy yelling and she's turning red because she's embarrassed. And the waiter's confused, and he's like, how about you go get me your manager, and we'll let him decide whether or not that was appropriate. And our waiter is so confused by this interaction that he doesn't try to solve it himself. He doesn't say, like, we don't need to get my manager involved. He goes and gets his manager right away. And his manager comes back with him, and before the manager can even introduce himself, Richie Rich is like, your waiter asked me what he could get me to drink. And he folds his arms like it was supposed to just be the bar of the century, you know? And the manager's looking at him, clearly confused on what the problem is, and goes, Okay, what about it? And Richie Rich is like, he had such a bad attitude about it. He was so rude. I've never had someone speak to me with such a rude tone in my life. I don't even want to eat here anymore. And the manager's confused and looks at the waiter and is like, Were you rude? And the waiter is, has like a look of confusion on his face and goes, No, I just said what I always say when I talk to a table. And Richie Rich just starts going off about how this waiter is lying and he's insanely rude. He probably treats all these customers horribly. And now like the entire restaurant is watching it because this guy's lying. And at that point, my friends and I are like, ah, okay, we're not going to let you get this dude fired and embarrass him in front of the whole restaurant because that just isn't what happened. So my friend's like, excuse me, excuse me. And the rich guy looks at us and is like, stay out of this. This has nothing to do with you. It's none of your business. 
and we just look at the manager and we're like, the waiter has been great to us. We overheard the conversation and it definitely was not rude at all. So we don't really know what this dude's on about, but like, don't be mad at the waiter for this. Because listen, I think everyone's had a situation where maybe you've had a bad day, you take something wrong, and like, that's fine, but to complain to the manager and try to get someone in like, real trouble for mistreating customers when they just didn't, that's crazy. Whatever though, now that this big scene has been made, his date just gets up and leaves, which I can't blame her for at all, if anything, she probably should have left sooner. Imagine that. What a horrible first impression. You're on a first date. He just starts screaming at the waiter, gets the manager involved. A random table is like, hey, dude, can you stop freaking out on this guy for no reason? So she leaves, and now he starts blaming the restaurant and the waiter for making his date leave, as if it's their fault that he was screaming at people and she decided to walk out. And, like, this guy's clearly off in his own little world, you know? I, I don't really know if his parents are Bill Gates or whatever. Even then, you're just delusional. But if you're gonna be off in your own little world, the, the caveat is you just can't bug anyone. Once you're in your own little delusional world and you start trying to get people fired and ruin their livelihoods, eh, it's different. You gotta come back to reality. And the manager, just having enough, just says, hey man, I think you should leave. Like, I, you've made a scene. Clearly, you don't want to eat here, so like, you should just leave. And now Richie Rich is offended, which, if you really feel like this guy's been so rude to you, you're so offended, they ruined your date, you'd probably want to leave anyways. But he so like throws his arms out in a surprised motion and goes, you're really gonna ask a paying customer to leave? And the manager, without missing a beat, just went, uh, well, you haven't ordered anything, so you're not a paying customer yet, so yeah. And he was like, fine, I'll take my business elsewhere, and stormed out all angrily. And it was just a very awkward, uncomfortable situation. I don't know. I, I don't know why he insisted on making a ginormous scene over nothing, but it was, it was just weird, dude. Doesn't matter how rich your parents are, if you have to scream at the waiter every time you go out to eat, that's not normal. So the other day I had to uh, go to Best Buy, one of my display port cables decided to take a poop on me and I wasn't about to like wait two days to not be able to use my favorite monitor, you know, like I just wasn't gonna do that. So I was gonna go to Best Buy and get one. So I go there, grab the display port cable, and I decide I'm already here, I'm just gonna go like look at the GPUs, see if there's any in stock, cause I don't know, for the last few years there weren't. And I didn't even need one. Like, I wasn't going to buy one. I, it's just at this point, every time I'm at an electronics store, I just check. And there's three dudes that are, like, college-aged, and they're kind of talking about, like, their professors and how it's crazy to be out on your own. So it's like they're probably freshmen in college-ish. And they start talking about how they wanted new PCs, and that's not abnormal. I feel like PC gaming is a lot more mainstream than it used to be. Not that it was ever, like, this super secret thing before, but with Twitch streaming, like YouTube, everybody has kind of, in my opinion, been like, no, gaming PCs are cool. Whereas it used to be like the really nerdy people. Which is good. I think that's a good thing. Anyways, one of them starts complaining about how their dad is only going to give them $2,000 to build a gaming PC. And how that's just really not enough and he doesn't understand what his dad expects him to do with $2,000. And I'm just like sitting there trying not to have my jaw drop listening to this because sure, is $2,000 the maximum amount of money you could spend on a PC? No, theoretically, like if you really wanted to build the greatest PC to ever exist, you could spend a lot more than $2,000. But a $2,000 PC is a pretty juicy peach. Like, that's a sweet little machine right there. You can basically do everything you need to do and some on a PC that would cost that much unless you found a way to spend your money in the stupidest ways possible. Like, I don't know on what planet you would have a $2,000 gaming PC if you knew what you were doing and didn't overpay for everything that wasn't capable of doing basically everything you wanted to do. And even then, if it's free, who cares if it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do? If someone gave me a free Chromebook, I would be hyped. I'd be like, sweet, thank you so much. You went to your parents and said, I really want a gaming PC. And they said, yeah, sure, here's two grand. And you're mad about it? I don't feel like many people can just go to their parents and ask for an expensive PC and have it delivered to them the next day. 
But what really blew me away is the other two dudes that he was with start to like sympathize with him and tell him that he's in the right for being upset. Bro, that sucks. No way. Why would they do that? And he's like, man, I know it sucks. I don't know. And then the other one's like, yeah, that blows, dude. I can't believe that. And after I heard that they were on his side, you know, like they were hyped at him for, for standing up for himself and he should ask for more money, I just got my display port and had to walk away, dude, because I, I didn't think what I was hearing was real. It was like a Cartman level glitch in the Matrix. I feel like Cartman used to be a joke, like the character on South Park. It's like, oh, no one will ever act this way. And for whatever reason, ever since the internet's become more prominent, I feel like more people act like Cartman every day. Either way, uh, if you don't want to spend $2,000 on a PC because you just think it's a waste of money, just build the $2,000 PC and give it to somebody because I guarantee you that they'll appreciate it, you know. And if that doesn't work, just give the money to me. I could find some stupid stuff to spend it on and I'd appreciate it. All jokes aside though, I, I really couldn't believe that he was sitting there complaining about his parents giving him a computer and his friends were like, dude, yeah, it's not good enough. Either way though, guys, I think that's gonna do it for the video. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, I'd really appreciate you taking a second to press the like button. Let me know what you thought in the comment section down below. And of course, subscribe if you're new. If you like these videos, but you'd rather listen to an audio version, I do post a podcast over on Spotify. I'll put a link in the description down below. Feel free to go check that out. And other than that, uh, yeah. I really appreciate the support lately. I'm getting back on the grind. I know the comments have said you guys like the longer videos with the shorter stories kind of put together. So I'm going to be delivering 12 days of scrubs still on schedule. But yeah, thank you so much, guys. Don't get anyone pregnant. If you do, make sure they're hot. And hopefully I'll see you all next time with another video. I'm out. Peace.